book twenty two of pierre or the ambiguities by herman melville this librivox recording is in the public domain the flower curtain lifted from before a tropical author with some remarks on the transcendental flesh brush philosophy chapter one some days passed after the fatal tidings from the meadows and at length somewhat mastering his emotions pierre again sits down in his chamber for grieve how he will yet work he must and now day succeeds day and week follows week and pierre still sits in his chamber the long rows of cooled brick kilns around him scarce know of the change but from the fair fields of his great 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 grandfather's manor summer hath flown like a swallow guest the perfidious white autumn hath peeped in at the groves of the maple and under pretence of clothing them in rich russet and gold hath stripped them at last of the slightest rag and then ran away laughing prophetic icicles depend from the arbors round about the old manorial mansion now locked up and abandoned and the little round marble table in the viny summer-house where of july mornings he had sat chatting and drinking negus with his gay mother is now spread with a shivering napkin of frost sleety varnish hath encrusted that once gay mother's grave preparing it for its final ceremonies of wrapping snow upon snow wild howl the winds in the woods it is winter sweet summer is done and autumn is done but the book like the bitter winter is yet to be finished that season's weed is long garnered pierre that season's ripe apples and grapes are in no crop no plant no fruit is out the whole harvest is done oh woe to that belated winter overtaken plant which the summer could not bring to maturity the drifting winter snows shall whelm it think pierre doth not thy plant belong to some other and tropical clime though transplanted to northern maine the orange tree of the floridas will put forth leaves in that parsimonious summer and show some few tokens of fruitage yet november will find no golden globes thereon and the passionate old lumberman december shall peel the whole tree wrench it off at the ground and toss it for a faggot to some lime kiln ah pierre pierre make haste make haste force thy fruitage lest the winter force thee watch yon little toddler how long it is learning to stand by itself first it shrieks and implores and will not try to stand at all unless both father and mother uphold it then a little more bold it must at least feel one parental hand else again the cry and the tremble long time is it ere by degrees this child comes to stand without any support but by and by grown up to man's estate it shall leave the very mother that bore it and the father that begot it and cross the seas perhaps or settle in far oregon lands there now do you see the soul in its germ on all sides it is closely folded by the world as the husk folds the tenderest fruit then it is born from the world husk but still now outwardly clings to it still clamours for the support of its mother the world and his father the deity but it shall yet learn to stand independent though not without many a bitter wail and many a miserable fall that hour of the life of a man when first the help of humanity fails him and he learns that in his obscurity and indigence humanity holds him a dog and no man that hour is a hard one but not the hardest there is still another hour which follows when he learns that in his infinite comparative minuteness and abjectness the gods do likewise despise him and own him not of their clan divinity and humanity then are equally willing that he should starve in the street for all that either will do for him now cruel father and mother have both let go his hand and the little soul toddler now you shall hear his shriek and his wail and often his fall 
when at saddle meadows pierre had wavered and trembled in those first wretched hours ensuing upon the receipt of isabel's letter then humanity had let go the hand of pierre and therefore his cry but when at last inured to this pierre was seated at his book willing that humanity should desert him so long as he thought he felt a far higher support then ere long he began to feel the utter loss of that other support too ay even the paternal gods themselves did now desert pierre the toddler was toddling entirely alone and not without shrieks if man must wrestle perhaps it is well that it should be on the nakedest possible plane the three chambers of pierre at the apostles were connecting ones the first having a little retreat where delhi slept was used for the more exacting domestic purposes here also their meals were taken the second was the chamber of isabel the third was the closet of pierre in the first the dining-room as they called it there was a stove which boiled the water for their coffee and tea and where delhi concocted their light repasts this was their only fire forewarned again and again to economize to the uttermost pierre did not dare to purchase any additional warmth but by prudent management a very little warmth may go a great way in the present case it went some forty feet or more a horizontal pipe after elbowing away from above the stove in the dining-room pierced the partition wall and passing straight through isabel's chamber entered the closet of pierre at one corner and then abruptly disappeared into the wall where all further caloric if any went up through the chimney into the air to help warm the december sun now the great distance of pierre's calorical stream from its fountain sadly impaired it and weakened it it hardly had the flavour of heat it would have had but very inconsiderable influence in raising the depressed spirits of the most mercurial thermometer certainly it was not very elevating to the spirits of pierre besides this calorical stream small as it was did not flow through the room but only entered it to elbow right out of it as some coquettish maidens enter the heart moreover it was in the furthest corner from the only place where with a judicious view to the light pierre's desk barrels and board could advantageously stand often isabel insisted upon his having a separate stove to himself but pierre would not listen to such a thing then isabel would offer her own room to him saying it was of no indispensable use to her by day she could easily spend her time in the dining-room but pierre would not listen to such a thing he would not deprive her of the comfort of a continually accessible privacy besides he was now used to his own room and must sit by that particular window there and no other then isabel would insist upon keeping her connecting door open while pierre was employed at his desk that so the heat of her room might bodily go into his but pierre would not listen to such a thing because he must be religiously locked up while at work outer love and hate must alike be excluded then in vain isabel said she would make not the slightest noise and muffle the point of the very needle she used all in vain pierre was inflexible here yes he was resolved to battle it out in his own solitary closet though a strange transcendental conceit of one of the more erratic and non-conforming apostles who was also at this time engaged upon a profound work above stairs and who denied himself his full sufficiency of food in order to ensure an abundant fire the strange conceit of this apostle i say accidentally communicated to pierre that through all the kingdoms of nature caloric was the great universal producer and vivifier and could not be prudently excluded from the spot where great books were in the act of creation and therefore he the apostle for one was resolved to plant his head in a hot bed of stove warmed air and so force his brain to germinate and blossom and bud and put forth the eventual crowning victorious flower though indeed this conceit rather staggered pierre for in truth there was no small smack of plausible analogy in it yet one thought of his purse would wholly expel the unwelcome intrusion and reinforce his own previous resolve however lofty and magnificent the movements of the stars whatever celestial melodies they may thereby beget yet the astronomers assure us that they are the most rigidly methodical of all the things that exist no old housewife goes her daily domestic round with one millionth 
part the precision of the great planet jupiter in his stated and unalterable revolutions he has found his orbit and stays in it he has timed himself and adheres to his periods so in some degree with pierre now revolving in the troubled orbit of his book pierre rose moderately early and the better to inure himself to the permanent chill of his room and to defy and beard to its face the cruelest cold of the outer air he would behind the curtain throw down the upper sash of his window and on a square of old painted canvas formerly wrapping some bale of goods in the neighbourhood treat his limbs of those early december mornings to a copious ablution in water thickened with incipient ice nor in this stoic performance was he at all without company not present but adjoiningly sympathetic for scarce an apostle in all those scores and scores of chambers but undeviatingly took his daily december bath pierre had only to peep out of his pain and glance round the multi-windowed enclosing walls of the quadrangle to catch plentiful half-glimpses all round him of many a lean philosophical nudity refreshing his meagre bones with crash towel and cold water quick be the play was their motto lively are our elbows and limbo all our tenuities oh the dismal echoings of the raspings of flesh-brushes perverted to the filing and polishing of the merest ribs oh the shuddersome splashings of pails of ice-water over feverish heads not unfamiliar with aches oh the rheumatical cracklings of rusted joints in that defied air of december for every thick frosted sash was down and every lean nudity courted the zephyr among all the innate hyena-like repellents to the reception of any set form of a spiritually minded and pure archetypical faith there is nothing so potent in its sceptical tendencies as that inevitable perverse ridiculousness which so often bestreaks some of the essentially finest and noblest aspirations of those men who disgusted with the common conventional quackeries strive in their clogged terrestrial humanities after some imperfectly discerned but heavenly ideals ideals not only imperfectly discerned in themselves but the path to them so little traceable that no two minds will entirely agree upon it hardly a new light apostle but who in superaddition to his revolutionary scheme for the minds and philosophies of men entertains some insane heterodoxical notions about the economy of his body his soul introduced by the gentlemanly gods into the supernal society practically rejects that most sensible maxim of men of the world who chancing to gain the friendship of any great character never make that the ground of boring him with the supplemental acquaintance of their next friend who perhaps is some miserable ninny love me love my dog is only an adage for the old country women who affectionately kiss their cows the gods love the soul of a man often they will frankly accost it but they abominate his body and will forever cut it dead both here and hereafter so if thou wouldst go to the gods leave thy dog of a body behind thee and most impotently thou strivest with thy purifying cold baths and thy diligent scrubbings with flesh brushes to prepare it as a meat offering for their altar nor shall all thy pythagorean and shellian dietings on apple parings dried prunes and crumbs of oatmeal cracker ever fit thy body for heaven feed all things with food convenient for them that is if the food be procurable the food of thy soul is light in space feed it then on light in space but the food of thy body is champagne and oysters feed it then on champagne and oysters and so shall it merit a joyful resurrection if there is any to be say wouldst thou rise with a lantern jaw and a spavine knee rise with brawn on thee and a most royal corporation before thee so shalt thou in that day claim respectful attention know this that while many a consumptive dietarian has but produced the merest literary flatulencies to the world convivial authors have alike given utterance to the sublimest wisdom and created the least gross and most ethereal forms and for men of demonstrative muscle and action consider that right royal epitaph which cyrus the great caused to be engraved on his tomb i could drink a great deal of wine and it did me a great deal of good ah foolish to think that by starving thy body thou shalt fatten thy soul is yonder ox fatted because yonder lean fox starves in the winter wood and prate not of despising thy body while still thou flourisheth thy flesh brush the finest houses are most cared for within the outer walls are freely left to the dust and the soot put venison in thee and so wit shall come out of thee it is one thing in the mill but another in the sack 
now it was the continual quadrangular example of those forlorn fellows the apostles who in this period of his half developments and transitions had deluded pierre into the flesh brush philosophy and had almost tempted him into the apple parings dialectics for all the long wards corridors and multitudinous chambers of the apostles were scattered with the stems of apples the stones of prunes and the shells of peanuts they went about huskily muttering the kantian categories through teeth and lips dry and dusty as any millers with the crumbs of graham crackers a tumbler of cold water was the utmost welcome to their reception rooms at the grand supposed sanhedrim presided over by one of the deputies of plotinus plinlimon a huge jug of adam's ale and a bushel basket of graham crackers were the only convivials continually bits of cheese were dropping from their pockets and old shiny apple parchments were ignorantly exhibited every time they drew out a manuscript to read you some were curious in the vintages of water and in three glass decanters set before you fairmount croton and contituate they held that croton was the most potent fairmount a gentle tonic and contituate the mildest and least inebriating of all take some more of the croton my dear sir be brisk with the fair mount why stops the constituent so on their philosophical tables went round their port their sherry and their claret some further advanced rejected mere water in the bath as altogether too coarse an element and so took to the vapour baths and steamed their lean ribs every morning the smoke which issued from their heads and overspread their pages was prefigured in the mists that issued from under their door-sills and out of their windows some could not sit down of a morning until after first applying the vapour bath outside and then thoroughly rinsing out their interiors with five cups of cold croton they were as faithfully replenished by our buckets and could they standing in one cordon have consecutively pumped themselves into each other then the great fire of eighteen thirty five had been far less widespread and disastrous ah ye poor lean ones ye wretched sokites and vaporites have not your niggardly fortunes enough rinsed ye out and wizened ye but ye must still be dragging the hose-pipe and throwing still more cold croton on yourselves in the world ah attach the screw of your hose-pipe to some fine old butt of madeira pump us some sparkling wine into the world see see already from all eternity two-thirds of it have lain helplessly soaking chapter two with cheek rather pale then and lips rather blue pierre sits down to his plank but is pierre packed in the mail for st petersburg this morning over his boots are his moccasins over his ordinary coat is his sword too and over that a cloak of isabel's now he is squared to his plank and at his hint the affectionate isabel gently pushes his chair closer to it for he is so muffled he can hardly move of himself now delly comes in with bricks hot from the stove and now isabel and she with devoted solicitude pack away these comforting stones in the folds of an old blue cloak a military garment of the grandfather of pierre and tenderly arrange it both over and under his feet but putting the warm flagging beneath then delly brings still another hot brick to put under his inkstand to prevent the ink from thickening then isabel drags the camp bedstead nearer to him on which are the two or three books he may possibly have occasion to refer to that day with a biscuit or two and some water and a clean towel and a basin then she leans against the plank by the elbow of pierre a crook-ended stick is pierre a shepherd or a bishop or a cripple no but he has in effect reduced himself to the miserable condition of the last with a crook-ended cane pierre unable to rise without sadly impairing his manifold entrenchments and admitting the cold air into their innermost nooks pierre if in his solitude he should chance to need anything beyond the reach of his arm then the crook-ended cane drags it to his immediate vicinity pierre glances slowly all round him everything seems to be right he looks up with a grateful melancholy satisfaction at isabel a tear gathers in her eye but she conceals it from him by coming very close to him stooping over and kissing his brow tis her lips that leave the warm moisture there not her tears she says i suppose i must go now pierre now don't don't be so long to-day i will call thee at half-past four thou shalt not strain thine eyes in the twilight we will see about that says pierre with an unobserved attempt at a very sad pun come thou must go leave me and there he is left pierre is young heaven gave him the divinest freshest form of a man put light into his eye and fire into his blood 
and brawn into his arm and a joyous jubilant overflowing up bubbling universal life in him everywhere now look around in that most miserable room and at that most miserable of all the pursuits of a man and say if here be the place and this be the trade that god intended him for a rickety chair two hollow barrels a plank paper pens and infernally black ink four leprously dingy white walls no carpet a cup of water and a dry biscuit or two oh i hear the leap of the texan comanche as at this moment he goes crashing like a wild deer through the green underbrush i hear his glorious whoop of savage and untamable health and then i look in at pierre if physical practical unreason make the savage which is he civilization philosophy ideal virtue behold your victim chapter three some hours pass let us peep over the shoulder of pierre and see what it is he is writing there in that most melancholy closet here topping the reeking pile by his side is the last sheet from his hand the frenzied ink not yet entirely dry it is much to our purpose for in this sheet he seems to have directly plagiarized from his own experiences to fill out the mood of his apparent author hero vivia who thus soliloquizes a deep down unutterable mournfulness is in me now i drop all humours or indifferent disguises and all philosophical pretensions i own myself a brother of the clod a child of the primeval gloom hopelessness and despair are over me as paul on paul away ye chattering apes of a sophomorean spinoza and plato who once did all but delude me that the night was day and pain only a tickle explain this darkness exorcise this devil ye cannot tell me not thou inconceivable coxcomb of a girda that the universe cannot spare thee and thy immortality so long as like a hired waiter thou makest thyself generally useful already the universe gets on without thee and could still spare a million more of the same identical kidney corporations have no souls and thy pantheism what was that thou wert but the pretensions heartless part of a man lo i hold thee in this hand and thou art crushed in it like an egg from which the meat hath been sucked here is a slip from the floor whence flow the panegyrical melodies that precede the march of these heroes from what but from a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal and here is a second cast thy eye in there on vivia tell me why those four limbs should be clapped in a dismal jail day out day in week out week in month out month in and himself the voluntary jailer is this the end of philosophy this the larger and spiritual life this your boasted empyrean is it for this that a man should grow wise and leave off his most excellent and calumniated folly and here is a third cast thy eye in there on vivia he who in the pursuit of the highest health of virtue and truth shows but a pallid cheek weigh his heart in thy hand o thou gold-laced virtuoso girda and tell me whether it does not exceed thy standard weight and here's a fourth o oh god that man should spoil and rust on the stalk and be wilted and threshed ere the harvest hath come and o oh god that men that call themselves men should still insist on a laugh i hate the world and could trample all lungs of mankind as grapes and heal them out of their breath to think of the woe and the cant to think of the truth and the lie o oh, blessed be the twenty-first day of december and cursed be the twenty-first day of june from these random slips it would seem that pierre is quite conscious of much that is so anomalously hard and bitter in his lot of much that is so black and terrific in his soul yet that knowing his fatal condition does not one whit enable him to change or better his condition conclusive proof that he has no power over his condition for in tremendous extremities human souls are like drowning men well enough they know they are in peril well enough they know the causes of that peril nevertheless the sea is the sea and these drowning men do drown chapter four from eight o'clock in the morning till half-past four in the evening pierre sits there in his room eight hours and a half from throbbing neck-bands and swinging belly-bands of gay-hearted horses the sleigh-bells chimingly jingle but pierre sits there in his room thanksgiving comes with its glad thanks and crisp turkeys but pierre sits there in his room soft through the snows on tinted indian moccasin merry christmas comes stealing but pierre sits there in his room it is new year's and like a great flagon the vast city over brims at all curbstones wharves and piers with bubbling jubilations but pierre sits there in his room 
nor jingling sleigh bells at throbbing neckband or swinging belly band nor glad thanks and crisp turkeys of thanksgiving nor tinted indian moccasin of merry christmas softly stealing through the snows nor new year's curbstones wharves and piers over brimming with bubbling jubilations nor jingling sleigh bells nor glad thanksgiving nor merry christmas nor jubilating new years nor bell thank christ year none of these are for pierre in the midst of the merriments of the mutations of time pierre hath ringed himself in with the grief of eternity pierre is a peak inflexible in the heart of time as the isle peak pico stands unassaultable in the midst of waves he will not be called to he will not be stirred sometimes the intent ear of isabel in the next room overhears the alternate silence and then the long lonely scratch of his pen it is as if she heard the busy claw of some midnight mole in the ground sometimes she hears a low cough and sometimes the scrape of his crook handled cane here surely is a wonderful stillness of eight hours and a half repeated day after day in the heart of such silence surely something is at work is it creation or destruction builds pierre the noble world of a new book or does the pale haggardness unbuild the lungs and the life in him unutterable that a man should be thus when in the meridian flush of the day we recall the black apex of night then night seems impossible this sun can never go down oh that the memory of the uttermost gloom as an already tasted thing to the dregs should be no security against its return one may be passably well one day but the next he may sup at black broth with pluto is there then all this work to one book which shall be read in a very few hours and far more frequently utterly skipped in one second and which in the end whatever it be must undoubtedly go to the worms not so that which now absorbs the time and the life of pierre is not the book but the primitive elementalizing of the strange stuff which in the act of attempting that book have upheaved and upgushed in his soul two books are being writ of which the world shall only see one and that the bungled one the larger book and the infinitely better is for pierre's own private shelf that it is whose unfathomable cravings drink his blood the other only demands his ink but circumstances have so decreed that the one cannot be composed on the paper but only as the other is writ down in his soul and the one of the soul is elephantinely sluggish and will not budge at a breath thus pierre is fastened on by two leeches how then can the life of pierre last lo he is fitting himself for the highest life by thinning his blood and collapsing his heart he is learning how to live by rehearsing the part of death who shall tell all the thoughts and feelings of pierre in that desolate and shivering room when at last the idea obtruded that the wiser and the profounder he should grow the more and the more he lessened the chances for bread that could he now hurl his deep book out of the window and fall to on some shallow nothing of a novel composable in a month at the longest then could he reasonably hope for both appreciation and cash but the devouring profundities now opened up in him consume all his vigour would he he could not now be entertainingly and profitably shallow in some pale lucid and merry romance now he sees that with every accession of the personal divine to him some great landslide of the general surrounding divineness slips from him and falls crashing away said i not that the gods as well as mankind had unhanded themselves from this pierre so now in him you behold the baby toddler i spoke of forced now to stand and toddle alone now and then he turns to the camp bed and wetting his towel in the basin presses it against his brow now he leans back in his chair as if to give up but again bends over and plods twilight draws on the summons of isabel is heard from the door the poor frozen blue-lipped soul-shivering traveller for st petersburg is unpacked and for a moment stands toddling on the floor then his hat and his cane and out he sallies for fresh air a most comfortless staggering of a stroll people gaze at him passing as at some imprudent sick man wilfully burst from his bed if an acquaintance is met and would say a pleasant newsmonger's word in his ear that acquaintance turns from him affronted at his hard aspect of icy discourtesy bad-hearted mutters the man and goes on he comes back to his chambers and sits down at the neat table of delhi and isabel soothingly eyes him and presses him to eat and be strong but his is the famishing which loathes all food he cannot eat but by force he has assassinated the natural day how then can he eat with an appetite if he lays him down he cannot sleep he has waked the infinite wakefulness in him 
then how can he slumber still his book like a vast lumbering planet revolves in his aching head he cannot command the thing out of its orbit fain would he behead himself to gain one night's repose at last the heavy hours move on and sheer exhaustion overtakes him and he lies still not asleep as children and day labourers sleep but he lies still from his throbbings and for that interval holdingly sheathes the beak of the vulture in his hand and lets it not enter his heart morning comes again the dropped sash the icy water the flesh brush the breakfast the hot bricks the ink the pen the from eight o'clock to half past four and the whole general inclusive hell of the same departed day ah shivering thus day after day in his wrappers and cloaks is this the warm lad that once sung to the world of the tropical summer end of book twenty two book twenty three of pierre for the ambiguities by herman melville this librivox recording is in the public domain a letter from pierre isabel arrival of lucy's easel and trunks at the apostles chapter one if a frontier man be seized by wild indians and carried far and deep into the wilderness and there held a captive with no slightest probability of eventual deliverance then the wisest thing for that man is to exclude from his memory by every possible method the least images of those beloved objects now forever reft from him for the more delicious they were to him in the now departed possession so much the more agonizing shall they be in the present recalling and though a strong man may sometimes succeed in strangling such tormenting memories yet if in the beginning permitted to encroach upon him unchecked the same man shall in the end become as an idiot with a continent and an ocean between him and his wife thus sundered from her by whatever imperative cause for a term of long years the husband if passionately devoted to her and by nature broodingly sensitive of soul is wise to forget her till he embrace her again is wise never to remember her if he hear of her death and though such complete suicidal forgettings prove practically impossible yet is it the shallow and ostentatious affections alone which are bustling in the offices of obituarian memories the love deep as death what mean those five words but that such love cannot live and be continually remembering that the loved one is no more if it be thus then in cases where entire unremorsefulness as regards the beloved absent objects is presumed how much more intolerable when the knowledge of their hopeless wretchedness occurs attended by the visitations of before latent upbraidings in the rememberer as having been any way even unwillingly the producers of their sufferings there seems no other sane recourse for some moody organizations on whom such things under such circumstances intrude but right and left to flee them whatever betide if little or nothing hitherto has been said of lucy tartan in reference to the condition of pierre after his departure from the meadows it has only been because her image did not willingly occupy his soul he had striven his utmost to banish it thence and only once on receiving the tidings of glenn's renewed attentions did he remit the intensity of those strivings or rather feel them as impotent in him in that hour of his manifold and overwhelming prostration not that the pale form of lucy swooning on her snow-white bed not that the inexpressible anguish of the shriek my heart my heart would not now at times force themselves upon him and cause his whole being to thrill with a nameless horror and terror but the very thrillingness of the phantom made him to shun it with all remaining might of his spirit nor were there wanting still other and far more wonderful though but dimly conscious influences in the breast of pierre to meet as repellents the imploring form 
not to speak of his being devoured by the all-exacting theme of his book there were sinister preoccupations in him of a still subtler and more fearful sort of which some inklings have already been given it was while seated solitary in his room one morning his flagging faculties seeking a momentary respite his head sideways turned toward the naked floor following the seams in it which as wires led straight from where he sat to the connecting door and disappeared beneath it into the chamber of isabel that he started at a tap at that very door followed by the wonted low sweet voice pierre a letter for thee dost thou hear a letter may i come in at once he felt a dart of surprise and apprehension for he was precisely in that general condition with respect to the outer world that he could not reasonably look for any tidings but disastrous or at least unwelcome ones he assented and isabel entered holding out the billet in her hand tis from some lady pierre who can it be not thy mother though of that i am certain the expression of her face as seen by me not at all answering to the expression of this handwriting here my mother from my mother muttered pierre in wild vacancy no no it can scarce be from her oh she writes no more even in her own private tablets now death hath stolen the last leaf and rubbed all out to scribble his own ineffaceable hic yacket there pierre cried isabel in a fright give it me he shouted vehemently extending his hand forgive me sweet sweet isabel i have wandered in my mind this book makes me mad there i have it now in a tone of indifference now leave me again it is from some pretty aunt or cousin i suppose carelessly balancing the letter in his hand isabel quitted the room the moment the door closed upon her pierre eagerly split open the letter and read chapter two this morning i vowed it my own dearest dearest pierre i feel stronger to-day for to-day i have still more thought of thine own superhuman angelical strength which so has a very little been transferred to me o oh, pierre pierre with what words shall i write thee now now when still knowing nothing yet something of thy secret i as a seer suspect grief deep unspeakable grief hath made me this seer i could murder myself pierre when i think of my previous blindness but that only came from my swoon it was horrible and most murdersome but now i see thou wert right in being so instantaneous with me and in never afterward writing to me pierre yes now i see it and adore thee the more ah thou too noble and angelical pierre now i feel that a being like thee can possibly have no love as other men love but thou lovest as angels do not for thyself but wholly for others but still are we one pierre thou art sacrificing thyself and i hasten to retie myself to thee that so i may catch thy fire and all the ardent multitudinous arms of our common flames may embrace i will ask of thee nothing pierre thou shalt tell me no secret very right wert thou pierre when in that ride to the hills thou wouldst not swear the fond foolish oath i demanded very right very right now i see it if then i solemnly vow never to seek from thee any slightest thing which thou wouldst not willingly have me know if ever i in all outward actions shall recognize just as thou dost the peculiar position of that mysterious and ever sacred being then may i not come and live with thee i will be no encumbrance to thee i know just where thou art and how thou art living and only just there pierre and only just so is any further life endurable or possible for me she will never know for thus far i am sure thou thyself hast never disclosed it to her what i once was to thee let it seem as though i were some nun-like cousin immovably vowed to dwell with thee in thy strange exile show not to me never show more any visible conscious token of love i will never to thee our mortal lives o oh, my heavenly pierre shall henceforth be one mute wooing of each other with no declaration no bridal till we meet in the pure realms of god's final blessedness for us till we meet where the ever interrupting and ever marring world cannot and shall not come 
where all thy hidden glorious unselfishness shall be gloriously revealed in the full splendour of that heavenly light where no more force to these cruelest disguises she she too shall assume her own glorious place nor take it hard but rather feel the more blessed when there thy sweet heart shall be openly and unreservedly mine pierre pierre my pierre only this thought this hope this sublime faith now supports me well was it that the swoon in which thou didst leave me that long eternity ago well was it dear pierre that though i came out of it to stare and grope yet it was only to stare and grope and then i swooned again and then groped again and then again swooned but all this was vacancy little i clutched nothing i knew twas less than a dream my pierre i had no conscious thought of thee love but felt an utter blank a vacancy for wert thou not then utterly gone from me and what could there then be left of poor lucy but now this long long swoon is past i come out again into life and light but how could i come out how could i any way be my pierre if not in thee so the moment i came out of the long long swoon straightway came to me the immortal faith in thee which though it could offer no one slightest possible argument of mere sense in thy behalf yet was it only the more mysteriously imperative for that my pierre know then dearest pierre that with every most glaring earthly reason to disbelieve in thy love i do yet wholly give myself up to the unshakable belief in it for i feel that always is love love and cannot know change pierre i feel that heaven hath called me to a wonderful office toward thee by throwing me into that long long swoon during which martha tells me i hardly ate altogether three ordinary meals by that heaven i feel now was preparing me for the superhuman office i speak of was wholly estranging me from this earth even while i yet lingered in it was fitting me for a celestial mission in terrestrial elements o oh, give to me of thine own dear strength i am but a poor weak girl dear pierre one that didst once love thee but too fondly and with earthly frailty but now i shall be wafted far upward from that shall soar up to thee where thou sittest in thine own calm sublime heaven of heroism o oh, seek not to dissuade me pierre wouldst thou slay me and slay me a million times more and never have done with murdering me i must come i must come god himself cannot stay me for it is he that commands me i know all that will follow my flight to thee my amazed mother my enraged brothers the whole taunting and despising world but thou art my mother and my brothers and all the world and all heaven and all the universe to me thou art my pierre one only being does this soul in me serve and that is thee pierre so i am coming to thee pierre and quickly to-morrow it shall be and never more will i quit thee pierre speak thou immediately to her about me thou shalt know best what to say is there not some connection between our families pierre i have heard my mother sometimes trace such a thing out some indirect cousinship if thou approvest then thou shalt say to her i am thy cousin pierre thy resolved and immovable nun-like cousin vowed to dwell with thee for ever to serve thee and her to guard thee and her without end prepare some little corner for me somewhere but let it be very near ere i come i shall send a few little things the tools i shall work by pierre and so contribute to the welfare of all look for me then i am coming i am coming my pierre for a deep deep voice assures me that all noble as thou art pierre some terrible jeopardy involves thee which my continual presence only can drive away i am coming i am coming lucy chapter three when surrounded by the base and mercenary crew man too long wanted to eye his race with a suspicious disdain suddenly is brushed by some angelical plume of humanity and the human accents of superhuman love and the human eyes of superhuman beauty and glory suddenly burst on his being then how wonderful and fearful the shock it is as if the sky cope were rent and from the black valley of jehoshaphat he caught upper glimpses of the seraphim in the visible act of adoring he held the artless angelical letter in his unrealizing hand he started and gazed round his room and out at the window commanding the bare desolate all-forbidding quadrangle and then asked himself whether this was the place that an angel should choose for its visit to earth then he felt a vast outswelling triumphantness that the girl whose rare merits his intuitive soul had once so clearly and passionately discerned should indeed in this most tremendous of all trials have acquitted herself with such infinite majesty then again he sunk utterly down from her as in a bottomless gulf 
and ran shuddering through hideous galleries of despair in pursuit of some vague white shape and lo two unfathomable dark eyes met his and isabel stood mutely and mournfully yet all ravishingly before him he started up from his plank cast off his manifold wrappings and crossed the floor to remove himself from the spot where such sweet such sublime such terrific revelations had been made him then a timid little rap was heard at the door pierre pierre now that thou art risen may i not come in just for a moment pierre come in isabel she was approaching him in her wonted most strange and sweetly mournful manner when he retreated a step from her and held out his arm not seemingly to invite but rather as if to warn she looked fixedly in his face and stood rooted isabel another is coming to me thou dost not speak isabel she is coming to dwell with us so long as we live isabel wilt thou not speak the girl still stood rooted the eyes which she had first fixed on him still remained wide openly riveted wilt thou not speak isabel said pierre terrified at her frozen immovable aspect yet too terrified to manifest his own terror to her and still coming slowly near her she slightly raised one arm as if to grasp some support then turned her head slowly sideways toward the door by which she had entered then her dry lips slowly parted my bed lay me lay me the verbal effort broke her stiffening enchantment of frost her thawed form sloped sidelong into the air but pierre caught her and bore her into her own chamber and laid her there on the bed fan me fan me he fanned the fainting flame of her life by and by she turned slowly toward him oh that feminine word from thy mouth dear pierre that she that she pierre sat silent fanning her oh i want none in the world but thee my brother but thee but thee and oh god am i not enough for thee bare earth with my brother were all heaven for me but all my life all my full soul contents not my brother pierre spoke not but he listened a terrible burning curiosity was in him that made him as heartless but still all that she had said thus far was ambiguous had i known had i but known it before oh bitterly cruel to reveal it now that she that she she raised herself suddenly and almost fiercely confronted him either thou hast told thy secret or she is not worthy the commonest love of man speak pierre which the secret is still a secret isabel then is she worthless pierre whoever she be foolishly madly fond doth not the world know me for thy wife she shall not come twere a foul blot on thee and me she shall not come one look from me shall murder her pierre this is madness isabel look now reason with me did i not before opening the letter say to thee that doubtless it was from some pretty young aunt or cousin speak quick a cousin a cousin isabel yet yet that is not wholly out of the degree i have heard tell me more and quicker more more a very strange cousin isabel almost a nun in her notions hearing of our mysterious exile she without knowing the cause hath yet as mysteriously vowed herself ours not so much mine isabel as ours ours to serve us and by some sweet heavenly fancy to guide us and guard us here then possibly it may be all very well pierre my brother my brother i can say that now any all words are thine isabel words and worlds with all their containings shall be slaves to thee isabel she looked eagerly and inquiringly at him then dropped her eyes and touched his hand then gazed again speak so more to me pierre thou art my brother art thou not my brother but tell me now more of her it is all newness and utter strangeness to me pierre i have said my sweetest sister that she has this wild nun-like notion in her she is wilful in it in this letter she vows she must and will come and nothing on earth shall stay her do not have any sisterly jealousy then my sister thou wilt find her a most gentle unobtrusive ministering girl isabel she will never name the not to be named things to thee nor hint of them because she knows them not still without knowing the secret she yet hath the big unspecializing sensation of the secret the mystical presentment somehow of the secret and her divineness hath drowned all womanly curiosity in her so that she desires not in any way to verify the presentiment content with the vague presentiment only for in that she thinks the heavenly summons to come to us lies even there in that isabel dost thou now comprehend me i comprehend nothing pierre there is nothing these eyes have ever looked upon pierre that this so comprehended ever as now do i go all agrope amid the wide mysteriousness of things yes she shall come it is only one mystery the more does she talk in her sleep here would it be well if i slept with her my brother on thy account wishful for thy sake to leave thee incommoded and 
and not knowing precisely how things really are she probably anticipates and desires otherwise my sister she gazed steadfastly at his outwardly firm but not interiorly unfaltering aspect and then dropped her glance in silence yes she shall come my brother she shall come but it weaves its thread into the general riddle my brother hath she that which they call the memory pierre the memory hath she that we all have the memory my sister not all not all poor belle hath but very little pierre i have seen her in some dream she is fair-haired blue eyes she is not quite so tall as i yet a very little slighter pierre started thou hast seen lucy tartan at saddle meadows is lucy tartan the name perhaps perhaps but also in the dream pierre she came with her blue eyes turned beseechingly on me she seemed as if persuading me from thee methought she was then more than thy cousin methought she was that good angel which some say hovers over every human soul and methought oh methought that i was thy other thy other angel pierre look see these eyes this hair nay this cheek all dark 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 and she the blue-eyed the fair-haired oh once the red-cheeked she tossed her ebon tresses over her she fixed her ebon eyes on him say pierre doth not a funerialness invest me was ever hearse so plumed o oh god that i had been born with blue eyes and fair hair those make the livery of heaven heard ye ever yet of a good angel with dark eyes pierre no 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 all blue 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 heaven's own blue the clear vivid unspeakable blue which we see in june skies when all clouds are swept by but the good angel shall come to thee pierre then both will be close by thee my brother and thou mayest perhaps elect elect she shall come she shall come when is it to be dear pierre to-morrow isabel so it is here written she fixed her eye on the crumpled billet in his hand it were vile to ask but not wrong to suppose the asking pierre no i need not say it wouldst thou no i would not let thee read it my sister i would not because i have no right to no right no right that is it no i have no right i will burn it this instant isabel he stepped from her into the adjoining room threw the billet into the stove and watching its last ashes returned to isabel she looked with endless intimations upon him it is burnt but not consumed it is gone but not lost through stove pipe and flue it hath mounted in flame and gone as a scroll to heaven it shall appear again my brother woe is me woe 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 is me oh woe do not speak to me pierre leave me now she shall come the bad angel shall tend the good she shall dwell with us pierre mistrust me not her considerateness to me shall be outdone by mine to her let me be alone now my brother chapter four though by the unexpected petition to enter his privacy a petition he could scarce ever deny to isabel since she so religiously abstained from preferring it unless for some very reasonable cause pierre in the midst of those conflicting secondary emotions immediately following the first wonderful effect of lucy's strange letter had been forced to put on toward isabel some air of assurance and understanding concerning its contents yet at bottom he was still a prey to all manner of devouring mysteries soon now as he left the chamber of isabel these mysteriousnesses remastered him completely and as he mechanically sat down in the dining-room chair gently offered him by delhi for the silent girl saw that some strangeness that salt stillness was in him pierre's mind was revolving how it was possible or any way conceivable that lucy should have been inspired with such seemingly wonderful presentiments of something assumed or disguising or non-substantial somewhere and somehow in his present most singular apparent position in the eye of world the wild words of isabel yet rang in his ears it were an outrage upon all womanhood to imagine that lucy however yet devoted to him in her hidden heart should be willing to come to him so long as she supposed with the rest of the world that pierre was an ordinarily married man but how what possible reason what possible intimation could she have had to suspect the contrary or to suspect anything unsound for neither at this present time nor at any subsequent period did pierre or could pierre possibly imagine that in her marvellous presentiments of love she had any definite conceit of the precise nature of the secret which so unrevealingly and enchantedly wrapped him but a peculiar thought passingly recurred to him here within his social recollections there was a very remarkable case of a youth who while all but affianced to a beautiful girl one returning his own throbbings with incipient passion became somehow casually and momentarily betrayed into an imprudent manifested tenderness toward a second lady 
or else that second lady's deeply concerned friends caused it to be made known to the poor youth that such committal tenderness toward her he had displayed nor had it failed to exert its natural effect upon her certain it is this second lady drooped and drooped and came nigh to dying all the while raving of the cruel infidelity of her supposed lover so that those agonizing appeals from so really lovely a girl that seemed dying of grief for him at last so moved the youth that morbidly disregardful of the fact that inasmuch as two ladies claimed him the prior lady had the best title to his hand his conscience insanely upbraided him concerning the second lady he thought that eternal woe would surely overtake him both here and hereafter if he did not renounce his first love terrible as the effort would be both to him and her and wed with the second lady which he accordingly did while through his whole subsequent life delicacy and honour toward his thus wedded wife forbade that by explaining to his first love how it was with him in this matter he should tranquillize her heart and therefore in her complete ignorance she believed that he was wilfully and heartlessly false to her and so came to a lunatic's death on his account this strange story of real life pierre knew to be also familiar to lucy for they had several times conversed upon it and the first love of the demented youth had been a schoolmate of lucy's and lucy had counted upon standing up with her as bridesmaid now the passing idea was self-suggested to pierre whether into lucy's mind some such conceit as this concerning himself and isabel might not possibly have stolen but then again such a supposition proved wholly untenable in the end for it did by no means suffice for a satisfactory solution of the absolute motive of the extraordinary proposed step of lucy nor indeed by any ordinary law of propriety did it at all seem to justify that step therefore he know not what to think hardly what to dream wonders nay downright miracles and no less were sung about love but here was the absolute miracle itself the outacted miracle for infallibly certain he inwardly felt that whatever her strange conceit whatever her enigmatical delusion whatever her most secret and inexplicable motive still lucy in her own virgin heart remained transparently immaculate without shadow of flaw or vein nevertheless what inconceivable conduct this was in her which she in her letter so passionately proposed altogether it amazed him it confounded him now that vague fearful feeling stole into him that rail as all atheists will there is a mysterious inscrutable divineness in the world a god a being positively present everywhere nay he is now in this room the air did part when i here sat down i displaced the spirit then condensed it a little off from this spot he looked apprehensively around him he felt overjoyed at the sight of the humanness of delhi while he was thus plunged into this mysteriousness a knock was heard at the door delhi hesitating rose shall i let any one in sir i think it is mr millthorpe's knock go and see go and see said pierre vacantly the moment the door was opened millthorpe for it was he catching a glimpse of pierre's seated form brushed past delhi and loudly entered the room ha ha well my boy how comes on the inferno that is it you are writing one is apt to look black while writing infernos you always love dante my lad i have finished ten metaphysical treatises argued five cases before the court attended all our society's meetings accompanied our great professor monsieur Vavoun, the lecturer through his circuit in the philosophical saloons sharing all the honours of his illustrious triumph and by the way let me tell you Vavoun secretly gives me even more credit than is my due for upon my soul i did not help write more than one half at most of his lectures edited anonymously though a learned scientific work on the precise cause of the modifications in the undulatory motion in waves a posthumous work of a poor fellow fine lad he was too a friend of mine yes here i have been doing all this while you still are hammering away at that one poor plaguy inferno oh there's a secret in dispatching these things patience patience you will let learn the secret time time i can't teach it to you my boy but time can i wish i could but i can't there was another knock at the door oh cried millthorpe suddenly turning round to it i forgot my boy i came to tell you that there is a porter with some queer things inquiring for you i happened to meet him downstairs in the corridors and i told him to follow me up i would show him the road here he is let him in let him in good delhi my girl thus far the rattlings of millthorpe if producing any effect at all had but stunned the averted pierre but now he started to his feet a man with his hat on stood in the door holding an easel before him is this mr glendinning's room gentlemen oh come in come in cried millthorpe all right 
oh is that you sir well well then and the man set down the easel well my boy exclaimed millthorpe to pierre you are in the inferno dream yet look that's what people call an easel my boy an easel an easel not a weasel you look at it as though you thought it a weasel come wake up wake up you ordered it i suppose and here it is going to paint and illustrate the inferno as you go along i suppose well my friends tell me it is a great pity my own things ain't illustrated but i can't afford it there now is that him to the niger which i threw into a pigeon-hole a year or two ago that would be fine for illustrations is it for mr glendinning you inquire said pierre now in a slow icy tone to the porter mr glendinning sir all right ain't it perfectly said pierre mechanically and casting another strange rapt bewildered glance at the easel but something seems strangely wanting here ay now i see i see it villain the vines thou hast torn the green heart-strings thou hast but left the cold skeleton of the sweet arbour wherein she once nestled thou besotted heartless hind and fiend thou dost thou so much as dream in thy shrivelled liver of the eternal mischief thou hast done restore thou the green vines untrample them thou accursed o oh my god my god trampled vines pounded and crushed in all fibres how can they live over again even though they be replanted curse thee thou nay nay he added moodily i was but wandering to myself then rapidly and mockingly pardon pardon porter i must humbly crave thy most haughty pardon then imperiously come stir thyself man thou hast more below bring all up as the astounded porter turned he whispered to millthorpe is he safe shall i bring him oh certainly smiled millthorpe i'll look out for him he's never really dangerous when i'm present there go two trunks now followed with l t blurredly marked upon the ends is that all my man said pierre as the trunks were being put down before him well how much that moment his eyes first caught the blurred letters prepaid sir but no objection to more pierre stood mute and unmindful still fixedly eyeing the blurred letters his body contorted and one side drooping as though that moment half way down stricken with a paralysis and yet unconscious of the stroke his two companions momentarily stood motionless in those respective attitudes in which they had first caught sight of the remarkable change that had come over him but as if ashamed of having been thus affected millthorpe summoning a loud merry voice advanced toward pierre and tapping his shoulder cried wake up wake up my boy he says he is prepaid but no objection to more prepaid what's that go go and jabber to apes a curious young gentleman is he not said millthorpe lightly to the porter look you my boy i'll repeat he says he's prepaid but no objection to more ah take that then said pierre vacantly putting something into the porter's hand and what shall i do with this sir said the porter staring drink a health but not mine that were mockery with a key sir this is a key you gave me ah well you at least shall not have the thing that unlocks me give me the key and take this ay ay here's the chink thank ye sir thank ye this'll drink i ain't called up porter for nothing stout's the word twenty one fifty one is my number any jobs call on me do you ever cart a coffin my man said pierre upon my soul cried millthorpe gaily laughing if you ain't writing an inferno then but never mind porter this gentleman is under medical treatment at present you'd better ab you understand squatulate porter there my boy he's gone I understand how to manage these fellows there's a trick in it my boy an off-handed sort of what do you call it you understand the trick the trick the whole world's a trick know the trick of it all's right don't know all's wrong ha ha the porter's gone then said pierre calmly well mr millthorpe you will have the goodness to follow him rare joke admirable good morning sir ha ha and with his unruffleable hilariousness millthorpe quitted the room but hardly had the door closed upon him nor had he yet removed his hand from its outer knob when suddenly it swung half open again and thrusting his fair curly head within millthorpe cried by the way my boy i have a word for you you know that greasy fellow who has been dunning you so of late well be at rest there he's paid i was suddenly made flush yesterday regular flood tide you can return it any day you know no hurry that's all but by the way as you look as though you were going to have company here just send for me in case you want to use me any bedstead to put up or heavy things to be lifted about don't you and the women do it now mind that's all again adios my boy take care of yourself stay cried pierre reaching forth one hand but moving neither foot stay in the midst of all his prior emotions struck by these singular traits in millthorpe but the door was abruptly closed and singing fa la la millthorpe in his seedy coat went tripping down the corridor plus heart minus head muttered pierre his eyes fixed on the door 
now by heaven the god that made millthorpe was both a better and a greater than the god that made napoleon or byron plus head minus heart pa the brains grow maggoty without a heart but the heart's the preserving salt itself and can keep sweet without the head delhi sir my cousin miss tartan is coming here to live with us delhi that easel those trunks are hers good heavens coming here your cousin miss tartan yes i thought you must have heard of her and me but it was broken off delhi sir sir i have no explanation delhi and from you i must have no amazement my cousin mine my cousin miss tartan is coming to live with us the next room to this on the other side there is unoccupied that room shall be hers you must wait upon her too delhi certainly sir certainly i will do anything said delhi trembling but but does mrs glendin din does my mistress know this my wife knows all said pierre sternly i will go down and get the key of the room and you must sweep it out what is to be put into it sir said delhi miss tartan why she is used to all sorts of fine things rich carpets wardrobes mirrors curtains why 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 look said pierre touching an old rug with his foot here is a bit of carpet drag that into a room here is a chair put that in and for a bed ay ay he muttered to himself i have made it for her and she ignorantly lies on it now as made so lie o oh god hark my mistress is calling cried delhi moving toward the opposite room stay cried pierre grasping her shoulder if both called at one time from these opposite chambers and both were swooning which door would you first fly to the girl gazed at him uncomprehendingly and affrighted a moment and then said this one sir out of mere confusion perhaps putting her hand on isabel's latch it is well now go he stood in an intent unchanged attitude till delhi returned how is my wife now again startled by the peculiar emphasis placed on the magical word wife delhi who had long before this been occasionally struck with the infrequency of his using that term she looked at him perplexedly and said half unconsciously your wife sir ay is she not god grant that she be oh tis most cruel to ask that of poor poor delhi sir tut for thy tears never deny it again then i swear to heaven she is with these wild words pierre seized his hat and departed the room muttering something about bringing the key of the additional chamber as the door closed on him delhi dropped on her knees she lifted her head toward the ceiling but dropped it again as if tyrannically awed downward and bent it low over till her whole form tremulously cringed to the floor god that made me and that wast not so hard to me as wicked delhi deserved god that made me i pray to thee ward it off from me if it be coming to me be not deaf to me these stony walls thou canst hear through them pity pity mercy my god if they are not married if i penitentially seeking to be pure am now but the servant to a greater sin than i myself committed then pity 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 o god that made me see me see me here what can delhi do if i go hence none will take me in but villains if i stay then for stay i must and they be not married then pity 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 end of book twenty three chapter twenty four of pierre or the ambiguities by herman melville this librivox recording is in the public domain lucy at the apostles chapter one next morning the recently appropriated room adjoining on the other side of the dining-room presented a different aspect from that which met the eye of delhi upon first unlocking it with pierre on the previous evening two squares of faded carpeting of different patterns covered the middle of the floor leaving toward the surbase a wide blank margin around them a small glass hung in the pier beneath that a little stand with a foot or two of carpet before it in one corner was a cot neatly equipped with bedding at the outer side of the cot another strip of carpeting was placed lucy's delicate feet should not shiver on the naked floor pierre isabel and delhi were standing in the room isabel's eyes were fixed on the cot i think it will be pretty cosy now said delhi palely glancing all round and then adjusting the pillow anew there is no warmth though said isabel pierre there is no stove in the room she will be very cold the pipe can we not send it this way and she looked more intently at him than the question seemed to warrant 
let the pipe stay where it is isabel said pierre answering her own pointed gaze the dining-room door can stand open she never liked sleeping in a heated room let all be it is well eh but there is a grate here i see i will buy coals yes yes that can be easily done a little fire of a morning the expense will be nothing stay we will have a little fire here now for a welcome she shall always have fire better change the pipe pierre said isabel that would be permanent and save the coals it shall not be done isabel doth not that pipe and that warmth go into thy room shall i rob my wife good delhi even to benefit my most devoted and true-hearted cousin oh i should say not sir not at all said delhi hysterically a triumphant fire flashed in isabel's eye her full bosom arched out but she was silent she may be here now at any moment isabel said pierre come we will meet her in the dining-room that is our reception place thou knowest so the three went into the dining-room chapter two they had not been there long when pierre who had been pacing up and down suddenly paused as if struck by some laggard thought which had just occurred to him at the eleventh hour first he looked toward delhi as if about to bid her quit the apartment while he should say something private to isabel but as if on a second thought holding the contrary of this procedure most advisable he without preface at once addressed isabel in his ordinary conversational tone so that delhi could not but plainly hear him whether she would or no my dear isabel though as i said to thee before my cousin miss tartan that strange and wilful nun-like girl is at all hazards mystically resolved to come and live with us yet it must be quite impossible that her friends can approve in her such a singular step a step even more singular isabel than thou in thy unsophisticatedness canst at all imagine i shall be immensely deceived if they do not to their very utmost strive against it now what i am going to add may be quite unnecessary but i cannot avoid speaking it for all that isabel with empty hands sat silent but intently and expectantly eyeing him while behind her chair delly was bending her face low over her knitting which she had seized so soon as pierre had begun speaking and with trembling fingers was nervously twitching the points of her long needles it was plain that she awaited pierre's accents with hardly much less eagerness than isabel marking well this expression in delhi and apparently not unpleased with it pierre continued but by no slightest outward tone or look seemed addressing his remarks to any one but isabel now what i mean dear isabel is this if that very probable hostility on the part of miss tartan's friends to her fulfilling her strange resolution if any of that hostility should chance to be manifested under thine eye then thou certainly wilt know how to account for it and as certainly wilt draw no inference from it in the minutest conceivable degree involving anything sinister in me no i am sure thou wilt not my dearest isabel for understand me regarding this strange mood in my cousin as a thing wholly above my comprehension and indeed regarding my poor cousin herself as a rapt enthusiast in some wild mystery utterly unknown to me and unwilling ignorantly to interfere in what almost seems some supernatural thing i shall not repulse her coming however violently her friends may seek to stay it i shall not repulse as certainly as i have not invited but a neutral attitude sometimes seems a suspicious one now what i mean is this let all such vague suspicions of me if any be confined to lucy's friends but let not such absurd misgivings come near my dearest isabel to give the least uneasiness isabel tell me have i not now said enough to make plain what i mean or indeed is not all i have said wholly unnecessary seeing that when one feels deeply conscientious one is often apt to seem superfluously and indeed unpleasantly and unbeseemingly scrupulous speak my own isabel and he stepped nearer to her reaching forth his arm thy hand is the caster's ladle pierre which holds me entirely fluid into thy forms and slightest moods of thought thou pourest me 
and i there solidify to that form and take it on and thenceforth wear it till once more thou mouldest me anew if what thou tellest me be thy thought then how can i help its being mine my pierre the gods made thee of a holy day when all the common world was done and shaped thee leisurely in elaborate hours thou paragon so saying in a burst of admiring love and wonder pierre paced the room while isabel sat silent leaning on her hand and half veiled with her hair delly's nervous stitches became less convulsive she seemed soothed some dark and vague conceit seemed driven out of her by something either directly expressed by pierre or inferred from his expressions chapter three pierre pierre quick quick they are dragging me back oh quick dear pierre what is that swiftly cried isabel rising to her feet and amazedly glancing toward the door leading into the corridor but pierre darted from the room prohibiting any one from following him halfway down the stairs a slight airy almost unearthly figure was clinging to the baluster and two young men one in naval uniform were vainly seeking to remove the two thin white hands without hurting them they were glenn stanley and frederick the elder brother of lucy in a moment pierre's hands were among the rest villain damn thee cried frederick and letting go the hand of his sister he struck fiercely at pierre but the blow was intercepted by pierre thou hast bewitched thou damned juggler the sweetest angel defend thyself nay nay cried glenn catching the drawn rapier of the frantic brother and holding him in his powerful grasp he is unarmed this is no time or place to settle our feud with him thy sister sweet lucy let us save her first and then what thou wilt pierre glendinning if thou art but the little finger of a man be gone with thee from hence thy depravity thy pollutedness is that of a fiend thou canst not desire this thing the sweet girl is mad pierre stepped back a little and looked palely and haggardly at all three i render no accounts i am what i am this sweet girl this angel whom ye two defile by your touches she is of age by the law she is her own mistress by the law and now i swear she shall have her will unhand the girl let her stand alone see she will faint let her go i say and again his hands were among them suddenly as they all for the one instant vaguely struggled the pale girl drooped and fell sideways toward pierre and unprepared for this the two opposite champions unconsciously relinquished their hold tripped and stumbled against each other and both fell on the stairs snatching lucy in his arms pierre darted from them gained the door drove before him isabel and delly who affrighted had been lingering there and bursting into the prepared chamber laid lucy on her cot then swiftly turned out of the room and locked them all three in and so swiftly like lightning was this whole thing done that not till the lock clicked did he find glenn and frederick fiercely fronting him gentlemen it is all over this door is locked she is in women's hands stand back as the two infuriated young men now caught at him to hurl him aside several of the apostles rapidly entered having been attracted by the noise drag them off from me cried pierre they are trespassers drag them off immediately glenn and frederick were pinioned by twenty hands and in obedience to a sign from pierre were dragged out of the room and dragged downstairs and given into the custody of a passing officer as two disorderly youths invading the sanctuary of a private retreat in vain they fiercely expostulated but at last as if now aware that nothing farther could be done without some previous legal action they most reluctantly and chafingly declared themselves ready to depart accordingly they were let go but not without a terrible menace of swift retribution directed to pierre chapter four happy is the dumb man in the hour of passion he makes no impulsive threats and therefore seldom falsifies himself in the transition from choler to calm proceeding into the thoroughfare after leaving the apostles it was not very long ere glenn and frederick concluded between themselves that lucy could not so easily be rescued by threat or force the pale inscrutable determinateness and flinchless intrepidity of pierre now began to domineer upon them 
for any social unusualness or greatness is sometimes most impressive in the retrospect what pierre had said concerning lucy's being her own mistress in the eye of the law this now recurred to them after much tribulation of thought the more collected glen proposed that frederick's mother should visit the rooms of pierre he imagined that though insensible to their own united intimidations lucy might not prove deaf to the maternal prayers had mrs tartan been a different woman than she was had she indeed any disinterested agonies of a generous heart and not mere match-making mortifications however poignant then the hope of frederick and glen might have had more likelihood in it nevertheless the experiment was tried but signally failed in the combined presence of her mother pierre isabel and delly and addressing pierre and isabel as mr and mrs glendinning lucy took the most solemn vows upon herself to reside with her present host and hostess until they should cast her off in vain her by turns suppliant and exasperated mother went down on her knees to her or seemed almost on the point of smiting her in vain she painted all the scorn and the loathing sideways hinted of the handsome and gallant glen threatened her that in case she persisted her entire family would renounce her and though she should be starving would not bestow one morsel upon such a recreant and infinitely worse than dishonourable girl to all this lucy now entirely unmenaced in person replied in the gentlest and most heavenly manner yet with a collectedness and steadfastness from which there was nothing to hope what she was doing was not of herself she had been moved to it by all encompassing influences above around and beneath she felt no pain for her own condition her only suffering was sympathetic she looked for no reward the essence of well-doing was the consciousness of having done well without the least hope of reward concerning the loss of worldly wealth and sumptuousness and all the brocaded applauses of drawing-rooms these were no loss to her for they had always been valueless nothing was she now renouncing but in acting upon her present inspiration she was inheriting everything indifferent to scorn she craved no pity as to the question of her sanity that matter she referred to the verdict of angels and not to the sordid opinions of man if any one protested that she was defying the sacred counsels of her mother she had nothing to answer but this that her mother possessed all her daughterly deference but her unconditional obedience was elsewhere due let all hope of moving her be immediately and once for all abandoned one only thing could move her and that would only move her to make her forever immovable that thing was death such wonderful strength in such wonderful sweetness such inflexibility in one so fragile would have been matter for marvel to any observer but to her mother it was very much more for like many other superficial observers forming her previous opinion of lucy upon the slightness of her person and the dulcetness of her temper mrs tartan had always imagined that her daughter was quite incapable of any such daring act as if sterling heavenliness were incompatible with heroicness these two are never found apart nor though pierre knew more of lucy than any one else did this most singular behaviour in her fail to amaze him seldom even had the mystery of isabel fascinated him more with a fascination partaking of the terrible the mere bodily aspect of lucy as changed by her more recent life filled him with the most powerful and novel emotions that unsullied complexion of bloom was now entirely gone without being any way replaced by sallowness as is usual in similar instances and as if her body indeed were the temple of god and marble indeed were the only fit material for so holy a shrine a brilliant supernatural whiteness now gleamed in her cheek her head sat on her shoulders as a chiselled statue's head and the soft firm light in her eyes seemed as much a prodigy as though a chiselled statue should give token of vision and intelligence isabel also was most strangely moved by this sweet unearthliness in the aspect of lucy but it did not so much persuade her by any common appeals to her heart as irrespectively commend her by the very signet of heaven in the deference with which she ministered to lucy's little 
occasional wants there was more of blank spontaneousness than compassionate voluntariness and when it so chanced that owing perhaps to some momentary jarring of the distant and lonely guitar as lucy was so mildly speaking in the presence of her mother a sudden just audible submissively answering musical string tone came through the open door from the adjoining chamber then isabel as if seized by some spiritual awe fell on her knees before lucy and made a rapid gesture of homage yet still somehow as it were without evidence of voluntary will finding all her most ardent efforts ineffectual mrs tartan now distressedly motioned to pierre and isabel to quit the chamber that she might urge her entreaties and menaces in private but lucy gently waved them to stay and then turned to her mother henceforth she had no secrets but those which would also be secrets in heaven whatever was publicly known in heaven should be publicly known on earth there was no slightest secret between her and her mother wholly confounded by this inscrutableness of her so alienated and infatuated daughter mrs tartan turned inflamedly upon pierre and bade him follow her forth but again lucy said nay there were no secrets between her mother and pierre she would anticipate everything there calling for pen and paper and a book to hold on her knee and write she traced the following lines and reached them to her mother i am lucy tartan i have come to dwell during their pleasure with mr and mrs pierre glendinning of my own unsolicited free will if they desire it i shall go but no other power shall remove me except by violence and against any violence i have the ordinary appeal to the law read this madame said mrs tartan tremblingly handing it to isabel and eyeing her with a passionate and disdainful significance i have read it said isabel quietly after a glance and handing it to pierre as if by that act to show that she had no separate decision in the matter and do you sir too indirectly connive said mrs tartan to pierre when he had read it i render no accounts madame this seems to be the written and final calm will of your daughter as such you had best respect it and depart mrs tartan glanced despairingly and insensibly about her then fixing her eyes on her daughter spoke girl here where i stand i forever cast thee off never more shalt thou be vexed by my maternal entreaties i shall instruct thy brothers to disown thee i shall instruct glen stanley to banish thy worthless image from his heart if banished thence it be not already by thine own incredible folly and depravity for thee mr monster the judgment of god will overtake thee for this and for thee madame i have no words for the woman who will connivingly permit her own husband's paramour to dwell beneath her roof for thee frail one to delhi thou needest no amplification a nest of vileness and now surely whom god himself hath abandoned for ever a mother may quit never more to revisit this parting maternal malediction seemed to work no visibly corresponding effect upon lucy already she was so marble white that fear could no more blanch her if indeed fear was then at all within her heart for as the highest and purest and thinnest ether remains unvexed by all the tumults of the inferior air so that transparent ether of her cheek that clear mild azure of her eye showed no sign of passion as her terrestrial mother stormed below helpings she had from unstirring arms glimpses she caught of aid invisible sustained she was by those high powers of immortal love that once siding with the weakest reed which the utmost tempest tosses then that utmost tempest shall be broken down before the irresistible resistings of that weakest reed end of book twenty four chapter twenty five part one of pierre or the ambiguities by herman melville this librivox recording is in the public domain lucy isabel and pierre pierre at his book and Chiladas. chapter one a day or two after the arrival of lucy when she had quite recovered from any possible ill effects of recent events 
events conveying such a shock to both pierre and isabel though to each in a quite different way but not apparently at least moving lucy so intensely as they were all three sitting at coffee lucy expressed her intention to practise her crayon art professionally it would be so pleasant an employment for her besides contributing to their common fund pierre well knew her expertness in catching likenesses and judiciously and truthfully beautifying them not by altering the features so much as by steeping them in a beautifying atmosphere for even so said lucy thrown into the lagoon and there beheld as i have heard the roughest stones without transformation put on the softest aspects if pierre would only take a little trouble to bring sitters to her room she doubted not a fine harvest of heads might easily be secured certainly among the numerous inmates of the old church pierre must know many who would have no objections to being sketched moreover though as yet she had had small opportunity to, to see them yet among such a remarkable company of poets philosophers and mystics of all sorts there must be some striking heads in conclusion she expressed her satisfaction at the chamber prepared for her inasmuch as having been formerly the studio of an artist one window had been considerably elevated while by a singular arrangement of the interior shutters the light could in any direction be thrown about at will already pierre had anticipated something of this sort the first sight of the easel having suggested it to him his reply was therefore not wholly unconsidered he said that so far as she herself was concerned the systematic practice of her art at present would certainly be a great advantage in supplying her with a very delightful occupation but since she could hardly hope for any patronage from her mother's fashionable and wealthy associates indeed as such a thing must be very far from her own desires and as it was only from the apostles she could for some time to come at least reasonably anticipate sitters and as those apostles were almost universally a very forlorn and penniless set though in truth there were some wonderfully rich-looking heads among them therefore lucy must not look for much immediate pecuniary emolument ere long she might indeed do something very handsome but at the outset it was well to be moderate in her expectations this admonishment came modifiedly from that certain stoic dogged mood of pierre born of his recent life which taught him never to expect any good from anything but always to anticipate ill however not in unreadiness to meet the contrary and then if good came so much the better he added that he would that very morning go among the rooms and corridors of the apostles familiarly announcing that his cousin a lady artist in crayons occupied a room adjoining his where she would be very happy to receive any sitters and now lucy what shall be the terms that is a very important point thou knowest i suppose pierre they must be very low said lucy looking at him meditatively very low lucy very low indeed well ten dollars then ten banks of england lucy exclaimed pierre why lucy that were almost a quarter's income for some of the apostles four dollars pierre i will tell thee now lucy but first how long does it take to complete one portrait two sittings and two mornings work by myself pierre and let me see what are thy materials they are not very costly i believe tis not like cutting glass thy tools must not be pointed with diamonds lucy see pierre said lucy holding out her little palm see this handful of charcoal a bit of bread a crayon or two and a square of paper that is all well then thou shalt charge one seventy-five for a portrait only one seventy-five pierre i am half afraid now we have set it far too high lucy thou must not be extravagant look if thy terms were ten dollars and thou didst crayon on trust then thou wouldst have plenty of sitters but small returns 
but if thou puttest thy terms right down and also sayest thou must have thy cash right down too don't start so at that cash then not so many sitters to be sure but more returns thou understandest it shall be just as thou sayest pierre well then i will write a card for thee stating thy terms and put it up conspicuously in thy room so that every apostle may know what he has to expect thank thee thank thee cousin pierre said lucy rising i rejoice at thy pleasant and not entirely unhopeful view of my poor little plan but i must be doing something i must be earning money see i have eaten ever so much bread this morning but have not earned one penny with a humorous sadness pierre measured the large remainder of the one only piece she had touched and then would have spoken banteringly to her but she had slid away into her own room he was presently roused from the strange reverie into which the conclusion of this scene had thrown him by the touch of isabel's hand upon his knee and her large expressive glance upon his face during all the foregoing colloquy she had remained entirely silent but an unoccupied observer would perhaps have noticed that some new and very strong emotions were restrainedly stirring within her pierre she said intently bending over toward him well well isabel stammeringly replied pierre while a mysterious colour suffused itself over his whole face neck and brow and involuntarily he started a little back from her self-proffering form arrested by this movement isabel eyed him fixedly then slowly rose and with immense mournful stateliness drew herself up and said if thy sister can ever come too nigh to thee pierre tell thy sister so beforehand for the september sun draws not up the valley vapour more jealously from the disdainful earth than my secret god shall draw me up from thee if ever i can come too nigh to thee thus speaking one hand was on her bosom as if resolutely feeling of something deadly there concealed but riveted by her general manner more than by her particular gesture pierre at the instant did not so particularly note the all-significant movement of the hand upon her bosom though afterward he recalled it and darkly and thoroughly comprehended its meaning too nigh to me isabel sun or dew thou fertilizest me can sunbeams or drops of dew come too nigh the thing they warm and water then sit down by me isabel and sit close wine in within my ribs if so thou canst that my one frame may be the continent of two fine feathers make fine birds so i have heard said isabel most bitterly but do fine sayings always make fine deeds pierre thou didst but just now draw away from me when we would most dearly embrace we first throw back our arms isabel i but drew away to draw so much the closer to thee well all words are errant skirmishers deeds are the army's self be it as thou sayest i yet trust to thee pierre my breath waits thine what is it isabel i have been more blockish than a block i am mad to think of it more mad than her great sweetness should first remind me of mine own stupidity but she shall not get the start of me pierre some way i must work for thee see i will sell this hair have these teeth pulled out but some way i will earn money for thee pierre now eyed her startledly touches of a determinate meaning shone in her some hidden thing was deeply wounded in her an affectionate soothing syllable was on his tongue his arm was out when shifting his expression he whisperingly and alarmedly exclaimed hark she is coming be still but rising boldly isabel threw open the connecting door exclaiming half hysterically look lucy here is the strangest husband fearful of being caught speaking to his wife with an artist's little box before her whose rattling perhaps had startled pierre lucy was sitting midway in her room opposite the open door so that at that moment both pierre and isabel were plainly visible to her the singular tone of isabel's voice instantly caused her to look up intently at once a sudden irradiation 
of some subtle intelligence but whether welcome to her or otherwise could not be determined shot over her whole aspect she murmured some vague random reply and then bent low over her box saying she was very busy isabel closed the door and sat down again by pierre her countenance wore a mixed and writhing impatient look she seemed as one in whom the most powerful emotion of life is caught in inextricable toils of circumstances and while longing to disengage itself still knows that all struggles will prove worse than vain and so for the moment grows madly reckless and defiant of all obstacles pierre trembled as he gazed upon her but soon the mood passed from her her old sweet mournfulness returned again the clear unfathomableness was in her mystic eye pierre er na ere i ever knew thee i have done mad things which i have never been conscious of but in the dim recalling i hold such things no things of mine what i now remember as just now done was one of them thou hast done nothing but shown thy strength while i have shown my weakness isabel yes to the whole world thou art my wife to her too thou art my wife have i not told her so myself i was weaker than a kitten isabel and thou strong as those high things angelical from which utmost beauty takes not strength pierre once such syllables from thee were all refreshing and bedewing to me now though they drop as warmly and as fluidly from thee yet falling through another and an intercepting zone they freeze on the way and clatter on my heart like hail pierre thou didst not speak thus to her she is not isabel the girl gazed at him with a quick and piercing scrutiny then looked quite calm and spoke my guitar pierre thou knowest how complete a mistress i am of it now before thou gettest sitters for the portrait sketcher thou shalt get pupils for the music teacher wilt thou and she looked at him with a persuasiveness and touchingness which to pierre seemed more than mortal my poor poor isabel cried pierre thou art the mistress of the natural sweetness of the guitar not of its invented regulated artifices and these are all that the silly pupil will pay for learning and what thou hast cannot be taught ah thy sweet ignorance is all transporting to me my sweet my sweet dear divine girl and impulsively he caught her in his arms while the first fire of his feeling plainly glowed upon him but ere he had yet caught her to him isabel had backward glided close to the connecting door which at the instant of his embrace suddenly opened as by its own volition before the eyes of seated lucy pierre and isabel stood locked pierre's lips upon her cheek chapter two notwithstanding the maternal visit of mrs tartan and the peremptoriness with which it had been closed by her declared departure never to return and her vow to teach all lucy's relatives and friends and lucy's own brothers and her suitor to disown her and forget her yet pierre fancied that he knew too much in general of the human heart and too much in particular of the character of both glenn and frederick to remain entirely untouched by disquietude concerning what those two fiery youths might now be plotting against him as the imagined monster by whose infernal tricks lucy tartan was supposed to have been seduced from every earthly seemliness not happily but only so much the more gloomily did he augur from the fact that mrs tartan had come to lucy unattended and that glenn and frederick had let eight-and-forty hours and more go by without giving the slightest hostile or neutral sign at first he thought that bridling their impulsive fierceness they were resolved to take the slower but perhaps the surer method to wrest lucy back to them by instituting some legal process but this idea was repulsed by more than one consideration not only was frederick of that sort of temper peculiar to military men which would prompt him in so closely personal and intensely private and family a matter to scorn the hireling publicity of the law's lingering arm and impel him as by the furiousness of fire to be his own writer and avenger for in him it was perhaps quite as much the feeling of an outrageous family affront to himself through lucy as her own presumed separate wrong however black which stung him to the quick 
not only were these things so respecting frederick but concerning glenn pierre well knew that be glenn heartless as he might to do a deed of love glenn was not heartless to do a deed of hate that though on that memorable night of his arrival in the city glenn had heartlessly closed his door upon him yet now glenn might heartfully burst pierre's open if by that he had all believed that permanent success would crown the fray besides pierre knew this that so invincible is the natural untamable latent spirit of a courageous manliness in man that though now socially educated for thousands of years in an arbitrary homage to the law as the one only appointed redress for every injured person yet immemorially and universally among all gentlemen of spirit once to have uttered independent personal threats of personal vengeance against your foe and then after that to fall back slinking into a court and hire with sops a pack of yelping pettifoggers to fight the battle so valiantly proclaimed this on the surface is ever deemed very decorous and very prudent a most wise second thought but at bottom a miserably ignoble thing frederick was not the watery man for that glenn had more grapey blood in him moreover it seemed quite clear to pierre that only by making out lucy absolutely mad and striving to prove it by a thousand despicable little particulars could the law succeed in tearing her from the refuge she had voluntarily sought a course equally abhorrent to all the parties possibly to be concerned on either side what then would those two boiling bloods do perhaps they would patrol the streets and at the first glimpse of lonely lucy kidnap her home or if pierre were with her then smite him down by hook or crook fair play or foul and then away with lucy or if lucy systematically kept a room then fall on pierre in the most public way fell him and cover him from all decent recognition beneath heaps on heaps of hate and insult so that broken on the wheel of such dishonour pierre might feel himself unstrung and basely yield the prize not the gibbering of ghosts in any old haunted house no sulphurous and portentous sign at night beheld in heaven will so make the hair to stand as when a proud and honourable man is revolving in his soul the possibilities of some gross public and corporeal disgrace it is not fear it is a pride horror which is more terrible than any fear then by tremendous imagery the murderer's mark of cain is felt burning on the brow and the already acquitted knife blood rusts in the clutch of the anticipating hand certain that those two youths must be plotting something furious against him with the echoes of their scorning curses on the stairs still ringing in his ears curses whose swift responses from himself he at the time had had much ado to check thoroughly alive to the supernaturalism of that mad frothing hate which a spirited brother forks forth at the insulter of a sister's honour beyond doubt the most uncompromising of all the social passions known to man and not blind to the anomalous fact that if such a brother stab his foe at his own mother's table all people and all juries would bear him out accounting everything allowable to a noble soul made mad by a sweet sister's shame caused by a damned seducer imagining to himself his own feelings if he were actually in the position which frederick so vividly fancied to be his remembering that in love matters jealousy is as an adder and that the jealousy of glenn was double addered by the extraordinary malice of the apparent circumstances under which lucy had spurned glenn's arms and fled to his always successful and now married rival as if wantonly and shamelessly to nestle there remembering all these intense incitements of both those foes of his pierre could not but look forward to wild work very soon to come nor was the storm of passion in his soul unratified by the decision of his coolest possible hour storm and calm both said to him look to thyself o pierre murders are done by maniacs but the earnest thoughts of murder these are the collected desperadoes pierre was such fate or what you will had made him such but such he was and when these things now swam before him when he thought of all the ambiguities which hemmed him in the stony walls all round that he could not overleap the million aggravations of his most malicious lot the last lingering hope of happiness licked up from him as by flames of fire and his one only prospect a black bottomless gulf of guilt upon whose verge he imminently teetered every hour then the utmost hate of glenn and frederick were jubilantly welcomed to him and murder done in the act of warding off their 
ignominious public blow seemed the one only congenial sequel to such a desperate career chapter three as a statue planted on a revolving pedestal shows now this limb now that now front now back now side continually changing to its general profile so does the pivoted statued soul of man when turned by the hand of truth lies only never vary look for no invariableness in pierre nor does any canting showman here stand by to announce his phases as he revolves catch his phases as your insight may another day passed on glenn and frederick still absenting themselves and pierre and isabel and lucy all dwelling together the domestic presence of lucy had begun to produce a remarkable effect upon pierre sometimes to the covertly watchful eye of isabel he would seem to look upon lucy with an expression illy befitting their singular and so supposed merely cousinly relation and yet again with another expression still more unaccountable to her one of fear and awe not unmixed with impatience but his general detailed manner toward lucy was that of the most delicate and affectionate considerateness nothing more he was never alone with her though as before at times alone with isabel lucy seemed entirely undesirous of usurping any place about him manifested no slightest unwelcome curiosity as to pierre and no painful embarrassment as to isabel nevertheless more and more did she seem hour by hour to be somehow inexplicably sliding between them without touching them pierre felt that some strange heavenly influence was near him to keep him from some uttermost harm isabel was alive to some untraceable displacing agency though when all three were together the marvellous serenity and sweetness and utter unsuspectingness of lucy obviated anything like a common embarrassment yet if there was any embarrassment at all beneath the, that roof it was sometimes when pierre was alone with isabel after lucy would innocently quit them meantime pierre was still going on with his book every moment becoming still the more sensible of the intensely inauspicious circumstances of all sorts under which that labour was proceeding and as the now advancing and concentring enterprise demanded more and more compacted vigour from him he felt that he was having less and less to bring to it for not only was it the signal misery of pierre to be invisibly though but accidentally goaded in the hour of mental immaturity to the attempt of a mature work a circumstance sufficiently lamentable in itself but also in the hour of his clamorous pennilessness he was additionally goaded into an enterprise long and protracted in the execution and of all things least calculated for pecuniary profit in the end how these things were so whence they originated might be thoroughly and very beneficially explained but space and time here forbid at length domestic matters rent and bread had come to such a pass with him that whether or no the first pages must go to the printer and thus was added still another tribulation because the printed pages now dictated to the following manuscript and said to all subsequent thoughts and inventions of pierre thus and thus and so and so else an ill match therefore was his book already limited bound over and committed to imperfection even before it had come to any confirmed form or conclusion at all oh who shall reveal the horrors of poverty in authorship that is high while the silly millthorpe was railing against his delay of a few weeks and months how bitterly did unreplying pierre feel in his heart that to most of the great works of humanity their authors had given not weeks and months not years and years but their wholly surrendered and dedicated lives on either hand clung to by a girl who would have laid down her life for him pierre nevertheless in his deepest highest part was utterly without sympathy from anything divine human brute or vegetable one in a city of hundreds of thousands of human beings pierre was solitary as at the pole and the great woe of all was this that all these things were unsuspected without and undivulgeable from within the very daggers that stabbed him were joked at by imbecility ignorance blockheadedness self-complacency and the universal bleridness and besottedness around him now he began to feel that in him the thews of a titan were forestallingly cut by the scissors of fate he felt as a moose hamstrung 
all things that think or move or lie still seemed as created to mock and torment him he seemed gifted with loftiness merely that it might be dragged down to the mud still the profound willfulness in him would not give up against the breaking heart and the bursting head against all the dismal lassitude and deathful faintness and sleeplessness and whirlingness and craziness still he like a demigod bore up his soul's ship foresaw the inevitable rocks but resolved to sail on and make a courageous wreck now he gave jeer for jeer and taunted the apes that gibed him with the soul of an atheist he wrote down the godliest things with the feeling of misery and death in him he created forms of gladness and life for the pangs in his heart he put down hoots on the paper and everything else he disguised under the so conveniently adjustable drapery of all stretchable philosophy for the more and the more that he wrote and the deeper and the deeper that he dived pierre saw the everlasting elusiveness of truth the universal lurking insincerity of even the greatest and purest written thoughts like knavish cards the leaves of all great books were covertly packed he was but packing one set the more and that a very poor jaded set and pack indeed so that there was nothing he more spurned than his own aspirations nothing he more abhorred than the loftiest part of himself the brightest success now seemed intolerable to him since he so plainly saw that the brightest success could not be the sole offspring of merit but of merit for the one thousandth part and nine hundred and ninety-nine combining and dovetailing accidents for the rest End of chapter twenty five part one chapter twenty five part two of pierre or the ambiguities by herman melville this librivox recording is in the public domain lucy isabel and pierre pierre at his book and chiladas so beforehand he despised those laurels which in the very nature of things can never be impartially bestowed but while thus all the earth was depopulated of ambition for him still circumstances had put him in the attitude of an eager contender for renown so beforehand he felt the unrevealable sting of receiving either plaudits or censures equally unsought for and equally loathed there given so beforehand he felt the pyramidical scorn of the genuine loftiness for the whole infinite company of infinitesimal critics his was the scorn which thinks it not worth the while to be scornful those he most scorned never knew it in that lonely little closet of his pierre foretasted all that this world hath either of praise or dispraise and thus foretasting both goblets anticipatingly hurled them both in its teeth all panegyric all denunciation all criticism of any sort would come too late for pierre but man does never give himself up thus a doorless and shutterless house for the four loosened winds of heaven to howl through without still additional dilapidations much oftener than before pierre laid back in his chair with the deadly feeling of faintness much oftener than before came staggering home from his evening walk and from sheer bodily exhaustion economized the breath that answered the anxious inquiries as to what might be done for him and as if all the leagued spiritual inveteracies and malices combined with his general bodily exhaustion were not enough a special corporeal affliction now descended like a skyhawk upon him his incessant application told upon his eyes they became so affected that some days he wrote with the lids nearly closed fearful of opening them wide to the light through the lashes he peered upon the paper which so seemed fretted with wires sometimes he blindly wrote with his eyes turned away from the paper thus unconsciously symbolizing the hostile necessity and distaste the former whereof made of him this most unwilling state's prisoner of letters as every evening after his day's writing was done the proofs of the beginning of his work came home for correction isabel would read them to him they were replete with errors but preoccupied by the thronging and undiluted pure imaginings of things he became impatient of such minute net like torments he randomly corrected the worst and let the rest go jeering with himself at the rich harvest thus furnished to the entomological critics 
but at last he received a tremendous interior intimation to hold off to be still from his unnatural struggle in the earlier progress of his book he had found some relief in making his regular evening walk through the greatest thoroughfare of the city that so the utter isolation of his soul might feel itself the more intensely from the incessant jogglings of his body against the bodies of the hurrying thousands then he began to be sensible of more fancying stormy nights than pleasant ones for then the great thoroughfares were less thronged and the innumerable shop awnings flapped and beat like schooners broad sails in a gale and the shutters banged like lashed bulwarks and the slates fell hurtling like displaced ships blocks from aloft stemming such tempests through the deserted streets pierre felt a dark triumphant joy that while others had crawled in fear to their kennels he alone defied the storm admiral whose most vindictive peltings of hellstones striking his iron frame fiery furnace of a body melted into soft dew and so harmlessly trickled from off him by and by of such howling pelting nights he began to bend his steps down the dark narrow side streets in quest of the more secluded and mysterious tap-rooms there he would feel a singular satisfaction in sitting down all dripping in a chair ordering his half-pint of ale before him and drawing over his cap to protect his eyes from the light ay the varied faces of the social castaways who here had their haunts from the bitterest midnights but at last he began to feel a distaste for even these and now nothing but the utter night desolation of the obscurest warehousing lanes would content him or be at all sufferable to him among these he had now been accustomed to wind in and out every evening till one night as he paused a moment previous to turning about for home a sudden unwanted and all-pervading sensation seized him he knew not where he was he did not have any ordinary life feeling at all he could not see though instinctively putting his hand to his eyes he seemed to feel that the lids were open then he was sensible of a combined blindness and vertigo and staggering before his eyes a million green meteors danced he felt his foot tottering upon the curb he put out his hands and knew no more for the time when he came to himself he found that he was lying crosswise in the gutter dabbled with mud and slime he raised himself to try if he could stand but the fit was entirely gone immediately he quickened his steps homeward forbearing to rest or pause at all on the way lest that rush of blood to his head consequent upon his sudden cessation from walking should again smite him down this circumstance warned him away from those desolate streets lest the repetition of the fit should leave him there to perish by night in unknown and unsuspected loneliness but if that terrible vertigo had been also intended for another and deeper warning he regarded such added warning not at all but again plied heart and brain as before but now at last since the very blood in his body had in vain rebelled against his titanic soul now the only visible outward symbols of that soul his eyes did also turn downright traitors to him and with more success than the rebellious blood he had abused them so recklessly that now they absolutely refused to look on paper he turned them on paper and they blinked and shut the pupils of his eyes rolled away from him in their own orbits he put his hand up to them and sat back in his seat then without saying one word he continued there for his usual term suspended motionless blank but next morning it was some few days after the arrival of lucy still feeling that a certain downright infatuation and no less is both unavoidable and indispensable in the composition of any great deep book or even any wholly unsuccessful attempt at any great deep book next morning he returned to the charge but again the pupils of his eyes rolled away from him in their orbits and now a general and nameless torpor some horrible foretaste of death itself seemed stealing upon him chapter four during this state of semi-unconsciousness or rather trance a remarkable dream or vision came to him the actual artificial objects around him slid from him and were replaced by a baseless yet more imposing spectacle of natural scenery but though a baseless vision in itself this airy spectacle assumed very familiar features to pierre it was the phantasmagoria of the mount of the titans a singular height standing quite detached in a wide solitude not far from the grand range of dark blue hills encircling his ancestral manor say what some poets will nature is not so much her own ever sweet interpreter 
as the mere supplier of that cunning alphabet whereby selecting and combining as he pleases each man reads his own peculiar lesson according to his own peculiar mind and mood thus a high aspiring but most moody disappointed bard chancing once to visit the meadows and beholding that fine eminence christened it by the name it ever after bore completely extinguishing its former title the delectable mountain one long ago bestowed by an old baptist farmer an hereditary admirer of bunyan and his most marvellous book from the spell of that name the mountain never afterward escaped for now gazing upon it by the light of those suggestive syllables no poetical observer could resist the apparent felicity of the title for as if indeed the immemorial mount would fain adapt itself to its so recent name some people said that it had insensibly changed its pervading aspect within a score or two of winters nor was this strange conceit entirely without foundation seeing that the annual displacements of huge rocks and gigantic trees were continually modifying its whole front and general contour on the north side where it fronted the old manor-house some fifteen miles distant the height viewed from the piazza of a soft haze canopied summer's noon presented a long and beautiful but not entirely inaccessible looking purple precipice some two thousand feet in air and on each hand sideways sloping down to lofty terraces of pastures those hillside pastures be it said were thickly sown with a small white amaranthine flower which being irreconcilably distasteful to the cattle and wholly rejected by them and yet continually multiplying on every hand did by no means contribute to the agricultural value of those elevated lands insomuch that for this cause the disheartened dairy tenants of that part of the manor had petitioned their lady landlord for some abatement in their annual tribute of upland grasses in the juny load rolls of butter in the october crock and steers and heifers on the october hoof with turkeys in the christmas sleigh the small white flower it is our bane the imploring tenants cried the aspiring amaranth every year it climbs and adds new terraces to its sway the immortal amaranth it will not die but last year's flowers survive to this the terraced pastures grow glittering white and in warm june still show like banks of snow fit token of the sterileness the amaranth begets then free us from the amaranth goodly or be pleased to abate our rent now on a somewhat nearer approach the precipice did not belie its purple promise from the manorial piazza that sweet imposing purple promise which seemed fully to vindicate the bunyanish old title originally bestowed but showed the profuse aerial foliage of a hanging forest nevertheless coming still more nigh long and frequent rents among the mass of leaves revealed horrible glimpses of dark dripping rocks and mysterious mouths of wolfish caves struck by this most unanticipated view the tourist now quickened his impulsive steps to verify the change by coming into direct contact with so chameleon a height as he would now speed on the lower ground which from the manor-house piazza seemed all a grassy level suddenly merged into a very long and weary acclivity slowly rising close up to the precipice's base so that the efflorescent grasses rippled against it as the efflorescent waves of some great swell or long rolling billow ripple against the water-line of a steep gigantic warship on the sea and as among the rolling sea-like sands of egypt disordered rows of broken sphinxes led to the chiapian pyramid itself so this long acclivity was thickly strewn with enormous rocky masses grotesque in shape and with wonderful features on them which seemed to express that slumbering intelligence visible in some recumbent beasts beasts whose intelligence seems struck dumb in them by some sorrowful and inexplicable spell nevertheless round and round those still enchanted rocks hard by their utmost rims and in among their cunning crevices the misanthropic hill-scaling goat nibbled his sweetest food for the rocks so barren in themselves distilled a subtle moisture which fed with greenness all things that grew about their igneous marge quitting those recumbent rocks you still ascended toward the hanging forest and piercing within its lowermost fringe then suddenly you stood transfixed as a marching soldier confounded at the sight of an impregnable redoubt where he had fancied it a practicable vault to his courageous thews 
cunningly masked hitherto by the green tapestry of the interlacing leaves a terrific towering palisade of dark mossy massiness confronted you and trickling with unevaporable moisture distilled upon you from its beetling brow slow thunder showers of water drops chill as the last dews of death now you stood and shivered in that twilight though it were high noon and burning august down the meads all round and round the grim scarred rocks rallied and re-rallied themselves shot up protruded stretched swelled and eagerly reached forth on every side bristlingly radiating with a hideous repellingness tossed and piled and indiscriminate among these like bridging rifts of logs up jammed in alluvial rushing streams of far arkansas or like great masts and yards of overwhelmed fleets hurled high and dashed amain all splintering together on hovering ridges of the atlantic sea you saw the melancholy trophies which the north wind championing the unquenchable quarrel of the winter had wrested from the forests and dismembered them on their own chosen battleground in barbarous disdain mid this spectacle of wide and wanton spoil insular noises of falling rocks would boomingly explode upon the silence and fright all the echoes which ran shrieking in and out among the caves as wailing women and children in some assaulted town stark desolation ruin merciless and ceaseless chills and gloom all here lived a hidden life curtained by that cunning purpleness which from the piazza of the manor-house so beautifully invested the mountain once called delectable but now styled titanic beaten off by such undreamed-of glooms and steeps you now sadly retraced your steps and mayhap went skirting the inferior sideway terraces of pastures where the multiple and most sterile inodorous immortalness of the small white flower furnished no aliment for the mild cow's meditative cud but here and there you still might smell from afar the sweet aromaticness of clumps of catnip that dear farmhouse herb soon you would see the modest verdure of the plant itself and wheresoever you saw that sight old foundation stones and rotting timbers of log-houses long extinct would also meet your eye their desolation illy hid by the green solicitudes of the unemigrating herb most fitly named the catnip since like the unrunagate cat though all that's human forsake the place that plant will long abide long bask and bloom on the abandoned hearth illy hid for every spring the amaranthine and celestial flower gained on the mortal household herb for every autumn the catnip died but never an autumn made the amaranth to wane the catnip and the amaranth man's earthly household peace and the ever encroaching appetite for god no more now you sideways followed the sad pasture skirt but took your way adown the long declivity fronting the mystic height in midfield again you paused among the recumbent sphinx-like shapes thrown off from the rocky steep you paused fixed by a form defiant a form of awfulness you saw enceladus the titan the most potent of all the giants writhing from out the imprisoning earth turbaned with upborne moss he writhed still though armless resisting with his whole striving trunk the pelion and the ossa hurled back at him turbaned with upborne moss he writhed still turning his unconquerable front toward that majestic mount eternally in vain assailed by him and which when it had stormed him off had heaved his undolphable incubus upon him and deridingly left him there to bay out his ineffectual howl to pierre this wondrous shape had always been a thing of interest though hitherto all its latent significance had never fully and intelligibly smitten him in his earlier boyhood a strolling company of young collegian pedestrians had chanced to light upon the rock and struck with its remarkableness had brought a score of picks and spades and dug round it to unearth it and find whether indeed it were a demoniac freak of nature or some stern thing of antediluvian art accompanying this eager party pierre first beheld that deathless son of terror at that time in its untouched natural state the statue presented nothing but the turbaned head of igneous rock rising from out the soil with its unabasable face turned upward toward the mountain and the bull-like neck clearly defined with distorted features scarred and broken and a black brow mocked by the upborn moss and Saladus there subterraneously stood fast frozen into the earth at the junction of the neck spades and picks soon heaved part of his ossa from him till at last a circular well was opened round him to the depth of some thirteen feet at that point the wearied young collegians gave over their enterprise in despair 
with all their toil they had not yet come to the girdle of enceladus but they had bared good part of his mighty chest and exposed his mutilated shoulders and the stumps of his once audacious arms thus far uncovering his shame in that cruel plight they had abandoned him leaving stark naked his in vain indignant chest to the defilements of the birds which for untold ages had cast their foulness on his vanquished crest not unworthy to be compared with that leaden titan wherewith the art of marcy and the broad-flung pride of bourbon enriched the enchanted gardens of versailles and from whose still twisted mouth were sixty feet the waters yet upgush in elemental rivalry with those etna flames of old asserted to be the malicious breath of the borne-down giant not unworthy to be compared with that leaden demigod piled with costly rocks and with one bent wrenching knee protruding from the broken bronze not unworthy to be compared with that bold trophy of high art this american enceladus wrought by the vigorous hand of nature's self it did go farther than compare it did far surpass that fine figure moulded by the inferior skill of man marcy gave arms to the eternally defenceless but nature more truthful performed an amputation and left the impotent titan without one serviceable ball and socket above the thigh such was the wild scenery the mount of titans and the repulsed group of heaven assaulters with enceladus in their midst shamefully recumbent at its base such was the wild scenery which now to pierre in his strange vision displaced the four blank walls the desk and camp bed and domineered upon his trance but no longer petrified in all their ignominious attitudes the herded titans now sprung to their feet flung themselves up the slope and anew battered at the precipice's unresounding wall foremost among them all he saw a moss-turbaned armless giant who despairing of any other mode of wreaking his immitigable hate turned his vast trunk into a battering ram and hurled his own arched out ribs again and yet again against the invulnerable steep enceladus it is enceladus pierre cried out in his sleep that moment the phantom faced him and pierre saw enceladus no more but on the titan's armless trunk his own duplicate face and features magnifiedly gleamed upon him with prophetic discomfiture and woe with trembling frame he started from his chair and woke from that ideal horror to all his actual grief chapter v nor did pierre's random knowledge of the ancient fables fail still further to elucidate the vision which so strangely had supplied a tongue to muteness but that elucidation was most repulsively fateful and foreboding possibly because pierre did not leap the final barrier of gloom possibly because pierre did not wilfully wrest some final comfort from the fable did not flog this stubborn rock as moses his and force even aridity itself to quench his painful thirst thus smitten the mount of titans seems to yield this following stream old titan self was the son of incestuous kellus and terra the son of incestuous heaven and earth and titan married his mother terra another and accumulatively incestuous match and thereof enceladus was one issue so enceladus was both the son and grandson of an incest and even thus there had been born from the organic blended heavenliness and earthliness of pierre another mixed uncertain heaven aspiring but still not wholly earth emancipated mood which again by its terrestrial taint held down to its terrestrial mother generated there the present doubly incestuous enceladus within him so that the present mood of pierre that reckless sky assaulting mood of his was nevertheless on one side the grandson of the sky for it is according to eternal fitness that the precipitated titan should still seek to regain his paternal birthright even by fierce escalade wherefore whoso storms the sky gives best proof he came from thither but whatso crawls contented in the moat before that crystal fort shows it was born within that slime and there for ever will abide recovered somewhat from the after-spell of this wild vision folded in his trance pierre composed his front as best he might and straightway left his fatal closet concentrating all the remaining stuff in him he resolved by an entire and violent change and by a wilful act against his own most habitual inclinations to wrestle with the strange malady of his eyes this new death-fiend of the trance and this inferno of his titanic vision 
and now just as he crossed the threshold of the closet he writhingly strove to assume an expression intended to be not uncheerful though how indeed his countenance at all looked he could not tell for dreading some insupportably dark revealments in his glass he had of late wholly abstained from appealing to it and in his mind he rapidly conned over what indifferent disguising or light-hearted gamesome things he should say when proposing to his companions the little design he cherished and even so to grim enceladus the world the gods had chained for a ball to drag at his or freighted feet even so that globe put forth a thousand flowers whose fragile smiles disguised his ponderous load End of book twenty five part two chapter twenty six of pierre or the ambiguities by herman melville this librivox recording is in the public domain a walk a foreign portrait a sail and the end chapter one come isabel come lucy we have not had a single walk together yet it is cold but clear and once out of the city we shall find it sunny come get ready now and away for a stroll down to the wharf and then for some of the steamers on the bay no doubt lucy you will find in the bay scenery some hints for that secret sketch you are so busily occupied with ere real living sitters do come and which you so devotedly work at all alone and behind closed doors upon this lucy's original look of pale rippling pleasantness and surprise evoked by pierre's unforeseen proposition to give himself some relaxation changed into one of infinite mute but unrenderable meaning while her swimming eyes gently yet all bewildered fell to the floor it is finished then cried isabel not unmindful of this by scene and passionately stepping forward so as to intercept pierre's momentary rapt glance at the agitated lucy that vile book it is finished thank heaven not so said pierre and displacing all disguisements a hectic unsummoned expression suddenly came to his face but ere that vile book be finished i must get on some other element than earth i have sat on earth's saddle till i am weary i must now vault over to the other saddle a while oh it seems to me there should be two ceaseless steeds for a bold man to ride the land and the sea and like circus-men we should never dismount but only be steadied and rested by leaping from one to the other while still side by side they both race round the sun i have been on the land steed so long oh i am dizzy thou wilt never listen to me pierre said lucy slowly there is no need of this incessant straining see isabel and i have both offered to be thy amanuenses not in mere copying but in the original writing i am sure that would greatly assist thee impossible i fight a duel in which all seconds are forbid ah pierre pierre cried lucy dropping the shawl in her hand and gazing at him with unspeakable longings of some unfathomable emotion namelessly glancing at lucy isabel slid near to him seized his hand and spoke i will go blind for thee pierre here take out these eyes and use them for glasses so saying she looked with a strange momentary haughtiness and defiance at lucy a general half involuntary movement was now made as if they were about to depart ye are ready go ye before said lucy meekly i will follow nay one on each arm said pierre come as they passed through the low arched vestibule into the street a cheek burnt gamesome sailor passing exclaimed steer small my lad tis a narrow strait thou art in what says he said lucy gently yes it is a narrow strait of a street indeed but pierre felt a sudden tremble transferred to him from isabel who whispered something inarticulate in his ear gaining one of the thoroughfares they drew near to a conspicuous placard over a door announcing that above stairs was a gallery of paintings recently imported from europe and now on free exhibition preparatory to their sale by auction 
though this encounter had been entirely unforeseen by pierre yet yielding to the sudden impulse he at once proposed their visiting the pictures the girls assented and they ascended the stairs in the ante-room a catalogue was put into his hand he paused to give one hurried comprehensive glance at it among long columns of such names as rubens raphael angelo de menachino da vinci all shamelessly prefaced with the words undoubted or testified pierre met the following brief line number ninety nine a stranger's head by an unknown hand it seemed plain that the whole must be a collection of those wretched imported daubs which with the incredible effrontery peculiar to some of the foreign picture dealers in america were christened by the loftiest names known to art but as the most mutilated torsos of the perfections of antiquity are not unworthy the student's attention neither are the most bungling modern incompletenesses for both are torsos one of perished perfections in the past the other by anticipation of yet unfulfilled perfections in the future still as pierre walked along by the thickly hung walls and seemed to detect the infatuated vanity which must have prompted many of these utterly unknown artists in the attempted execution by feeble hand of vigorous themes he could not repress the most melancholy foreboding concerning himself all the walls of the world seemed thickly hung with the empty and impotent scope of pictures grandly outlined but miserably filled the smaller and humbler pictures representing little familiar things were by far the best executed but these though touching him not unpleasingly in one restricted sense awoke no dormant majesties in his soul and therefore upon the whole were contemptibly inadequate and unsatisfactory at last pierre and isabel came to that painting of which pierre was capriciously in search number ninety nine my god see see cried isabel under strong excitement only my mirror has ever shown me that look before see see by some mere hocus-pocus of chance or subtly designing knavery a real italian gem of art had found its way into this most hybrid collection of impostures no one who has passed through the great galleries of europe unbewildered by their wonderful multitudinousness of surpassing excellence a redundancy which neutralizes all discrimination or individualizing capacity in most ordinary minds no calm penetrative person can have victoriously run that painted gauntlet of the gods without certain very special emotions called forth by some one or more individual paintings to which however both the catalogues and the criticisms of the greatest connoisseurs deny any all transcending merit at all answering to the effect thus casually produced there is no time now to show fully how this is suffice it that in such instances it is not the abstract excellence always but often the accidental congeniality which occasions this wonderful emotion still the individual himself is apt to impute it to a different cause hence the headlong enthusiastic admiration of some one or two men for things not at all praised by or at most which are indifferent to the rest of the world a matter so often considered inexplicable but in this stranger's head by the unknown hand the abstract general excellence united with the all-surprising accidental congeniality in producing an accumulated impression of power upon both pierre and isabel nor was the strangeness of this at all impaired by the apparent uninterestedness of lucy concerning that very picture indeed lucy who owing to the occasional jolting of the crowd had loosened her arm from pierre's and so gradually had gone on along the pictured hall in advance lucy had thus passed the strange painting without the least special pause and had now wandered round to the precisely opposite side of the hall where at this present time she was standing motionless before a very tolerable copy the only other good thing in the collection 
of that sweetest most touching but most awful of all feminine heads the senchi of guido the wonderfulness of which head consists chiefly perhaps in a striking suggested contrast half identical with and half analogous to that almost supernatural one sometimes visible in the maidens of tropical nations namely soft and light blue eyes with an extremely fair complexion veiled by funereally jetty hair but with blue eyes and fair complexion the senchi's hair is golden physically therefore all is in strict natural keeping which nevertheless still the more intensifies the suggested fanciful anomaly of so sweetly and seraphically blonde a being being double-hooded as it were by the black crape of the two most horrible crimes of one of which she is the object and of the other the agent possible to civilized humanity incest and parricide now this senchi and the stranger were hung at a good elevation in one of the upper tiers and from the opposite walls exactly faced each other so that in secret they seemed pantomimically talking over and across the heads of the living spectators below with the aspect of the senchi every one is familiar the stranger was a dark comely youthful man's head portentously looking out of a dark shaded ground and ambiguously smiling there was no discoverable drapery the dark head with its crisp curly jetty hair seemed just disentangling itself from out of curtains and clouds but to isabel in the eye and on the brow were certain shadowy traces of her own unmistakable likeness while to pierre this face was in part as the resurrection of the one he had burnt at the inn not that the separate features were the same but the pervading look of it the subtler interior keeping of the entirety was almost identical still for all this there was an unequivocal aspect of foreignness of europeanism about both the face itself and the general painting is it is it can it be whispered isabel intensely now isabel knew nothing of the painting which pierre had destroyed but she solely referred to the living being who under the designation of her father had visited her at the cheerful house to which she had been removed during childhood from the large and unnameable one by the pleasant woman in the coach without doubt though indeed she might not have been at all conscious of it in her own mystic mind she must have somehow vaguely fancied that this being had always through life worn the same aspect to everybody else which he had to her for so very brief an interval of his possible existence solely knowing him or dreaming of him it may have been under that one aspect she could not conceive of him under any other whether or not these considerations touching isabel's ideas occurred to pierre at this moment is very improbable at any rate he said nothing to her either to deceive or undeceive either to enlighten or obscure for indeed he was too much riveted by his own far interior emotions to analyse now the co-temporary ones of isabel so that there here came to pass a not unremarkable thing for though both were intensely excited by one object yet their two minds and memories were thereby directed to entirely different contemplations while still each for the time however unreasonably might have vaguely supposed the other occupied by one and the same contemplation pierre was thinking of the chair portrait isabel of the living face yet isabel's fervid exclamations having reference to the living face were now as it were mechanically responded to by pierre in syllables having reference to the chair portrait nevertheless so subtle and spontaneous was it all that neither perhaps ever afterward discovered this contradiction for events whirled them so rapidly and peremptorily after this that they had no time for those calm retrospective reveries indispensable perhaps to such a discovery is it is it can it be was the intense whisper of isabel no it cannot be it is not replied pierre one of the wonderful coincidences nothing more oh by that word pierre we but vainly seek to explain the inexplicable tell me it is it must be it is wonderful let us be gone and let us keep eternal silence said pierre quickly 
and seeking lucy they abruptly left the place as before pierre seemingly unwilling to be accosted by any one he knew or who knew his companions unconsciously accelerating their steps while forced for a space to tread the thoroughfares chapter two as they hurried on pierre was silent but while thoughts were hurrying and shouting in his heart the most tremendous displacing and revolutionizing thoughts were upheaving in him with reference to isabel nor though at the time he was hardly conscious of such a thing were these thoughts wholly unwelcome to him how did he know that isabel was his sister setting aside aunt dorothea's nebulous legend to which in some shadowy points here and there isabel's still more nebulous story seemed to fit on though but uncertainly enough and both of which thus blurredly conjoining narrations regarded in the unscrupulous light of real naked reason were anything but legitimately conclusive and setting aside his own dim reminiscences of his wandering father's deathbed, for though in one point of view those reminiscences might have afforded some degree of presumption as to his father's having been the parent of an unacknowledged daughter yet were they entirely inconclusive as to that presumed daughter's identity and the grand point now with pierre was not the general question whether his father had had a daughter but whether assuming that he had had isabel rather than any other living being was that daughter and setting aside all his own manifold and interinfolding mystic and transcendental persuasions originally born as he now seemed to feel purely of an intense procreative enthusiasm an enthusiasm no longer so all potential with him as of yore setting all these aside and coming to the plain palpable facts how did he know that isabel was his sister nothing that he saw in her face could he remember as having seen in his father's the chair portrait that was the entire sum and substance of all possible rakeable downright presumptive evidence which peculiarly appealed to his own separate self yet here was another portrait of a complete stranger a european a portrait imported from across the seas and to be sold at public auction which was just as strong an evidence as the other then the original of this second portrait was as much the father of isabel as the original of the chair portrait but perhaps there was no original at all to this second portrait it might have been a pure fancy piece to which conceit indeed the uncharacterizing style of the of the filling up seemed to furnish no small testimony with such bewildering meditations as these in him running up like clasping waves upon the strand of the most latent secrecies of his soul and with both isabel and lucy bodily touching his sides as he walked the feelings of pierre were entirely untranslatable into any words that can be used of late to pierre much more vividly than ever before the whole story of isabel had seemed an enigma a mystery an imaginative delirium especially since he had got so deep into the inventional mysteries of his book for he who is most practically and deeply conversant with mysticisms and mysteries he who professionally deals in mysticisms and mysteries himself often that man more than anybody else is disposed to regard such things in others as very deceptively bejuggling and likewise is apt to be rather materialistic in all his own merely personal notions as in their practical lives with priests of the Lusinian religions and more than any other man is often inclined at the bottom of his soul to be uncompromisingly sceptical on all novel visionary hypotheses of any kind it is only the no mystics or the half mystics who properly speaking are credulous so that in pierre was presented the apparent anomaly of a mind which by becoming really profound in itself grew sceptical of all tendered profundities whereas the contrary is generally supposed by some strange arts isabel's wonderful story might have been some way or for some cause forged for her in her childhood and craftily impressed upon her youthful mind which so like a slight mark in a young tree had now enlargingly grown with her growth till it had become this immense staring marvel tested by anything real practical and reasonable what less probable for instance than that fancy crossing of the sea in her childhood when upon pierre's subsequent questioning of her she did not even know that the sea was salt chapter three in the midst of all these mental confusions they arrived at the wharf 
and selecting the most inviting of the various boats which lay about them in three or four adjacent ferry slips and one which was bound for a half hour's sail across the wide beauty of that glorious bay they soon found themselves afloat and in swift gliding motion they stood leaning on the rail of the guard as the sharp craft darted out from among the lofty pine forests of ship's masts and the tangled underbrush and cane breaks of the dwarf sticks of sloops and scows soon the spires of stone on the land blent with the mass of wood on the water the crotch of the twin rivers pressed the great wedge city almost out of sight they swept by two little islets distant from the shore they wholly curved away from the domes of freestone and marble and gained the great sublime dome of the bay's wide open waters small breeze had been felt in the pent city that day but the fair breeze of naked nature now blew in their faces the waves began to gather and roll and just as they gained a point where still beyond between high promontories of fortresses the wide bay visibly sluiced into the atlantic isabel convulsively grasped the arm of pierre and convulsively spoke i feel it i feel it it is it is what feelest thou what is it the motion the motion dost thou not understand pierre said lucy eyeing with concern and wonder his pale staring aspect the waves it is the motion of the waves that isabel speaks of look they are rolling direct from the sea now again pierre lapsed into a still stranger silence and reverie it was impossible altogether to resist the force of this striking corroboration of by far the most surprising and, Im and improbable thing in the whole surprising and improbable story of isabel well did he remember her vague reminiscence of the teetering sea that did not slope exactly as the floors of the unknown abandoned old house among the french-like mountains while well, plunged in these mutually neutralizing thoughts of the strange picture and the last exclamations of isabel the boat arrived at its destination a little hamlet on the beach not very far from the great blue sluice way into the ocean which was now yet more distinctly visible than before don't let us stop here cried isabel look let us go through there bell must go through there see see out there upon the blue yonder yonder far away out out far far away and away and away out there where the two blues meet and are nothing bell must go why isabel murmured lucy that would be to go to far england or france thou wouldst find but few friends in far france isabel friends in far france and what friends have i here art thou my friend in thy secret heart dost thou wish me well and for thee pierre what am i but a vile clog to thee dragging thee back from all thy felicity yes i will go yonder yonder out there i will i will unhand me let me plunge for an instant lucy looked incoherently from one to the other but both she and pierre now mechanically again seized isabel's frantic arms as they were again thrown over the outer rail of the boat they dragged her back they spoke to her they soothed her but though less vehement isabel still looked deeply distrustfully at lucy and deeply reproachfully at pierre they did not leave the boat as intended too glad were they all when it unloosed from its fastenings and turned about upon the backward trip stepping to shore pierre once more hurried his companions through the unavoidable publicity of the thoroughfares but less rapidly proceeded soon as they gained the more secluded streets chapter four gaining the apostles and leaving his two companions to the privacy of their chambers pierre sat silent and intent by the stove in the dining-room for a time and then was on the point of entering his closet from the corridor when delly suddenly following him said to him that she had forgotten to mention it before but he would find two letters in his room which had been separately left at the door during the absence of the party he passed into the closet and slowly shooting the bolt which for want of something better happened to be an old blunted dagger walked with his cap yet unmoved slowly up to the table and beheld the letters they were lying with their sealed sides up one in either hand he lifted them and held them straight out sideways from him i see not the writing no not yet by mine own eye that they are meant for me yet in these hands i feel that i now hold the final poniards that shall stab me and by stabbing me make me too a most swift stabber in the recoil which point first this he tore open the left-hand letter sir you are a swindler upon the pretence of writing a popular novel for us 
you have been receiving cash advances from us while passing through our press the sheets of a blasphemous rhapsody filched from the vile atheists lucian and voltaire our great press of publication has hitherto prevented our slightest inspection of our readers proofs of your book send not another sheet to us our bill for printing thus far and also for our cash advances swindled out of us by you is now in the hands of our lawyer who is instructed to proceed with instant rigour signed steel flint and asbestos he folded the left-hand letter and put it beneath his left heel and stood upon it so and then opened the right-hand letter thou pierre glendinning art a villainous and perjured liar it is the sole object of this letter imprintedly to convey the point-blank lie to thee that taken in at thy heart it may be thence pulsed with thy blood throughout thy system we have let some interval pass inactive to confirm and solidify our hate separately and together we brand thee in thy every lung cell a liar liar because that is the scornfullest and loathsomest title for a man which in itself is the compend of all infamous things signed glendinning stanley frederick tartan he folded the right-hand letter and put it beneath his right heel then folding his two arms stood upon both the letters these are most small circumstances but happening just now to me become indices to all immensities for now am i hate shod on these i will skate to my acquittal no longer do i hold terms with aught world's bread of life and world's breath of honour both are snatched from me but i defy all world's bread and breath here i step out before the drawn-up worlds in widest space and challenge one and all of them to battle o oh, glen o oh, fred most fraternally do i leap to your rib crushing hugs oh how i love ye too that ye can make me lively hate in a world which elsewise only merits stagnant scorn now then where is this swindler's this coiner's book here on this vile counter over which the coiner thought to pass it to the world here will i nail it fast for a detected cheat and thus nailed fast now do i spit upon it and so get the start of the wise world's worst abuse of it now i go out to meet my fate walking toward me in the street as with hat on and glen and frederick's letter invisibly crumpled in his hand he as it were somnambulously passed into the room of isabel she gave loose to a thin long shriek at his wondrous white and haggard plight and then without the power to stir toward him sat petrified in her chair as one embalmed and glazed with icy varnish he heeded her not but passed straight on through both intervening rooms and without a knock unpremeditatedly entered lucy's chamber he would have passed out of that also into the corridor without one word but something stayed him the marble girl sat before her easel a small box of pointed charcoal and some pencils by her side her painter's wand held out against the frame the charcoal pencil suspended in two fingers while with the same hand holding a crust of bread she was lightly brushing the portrait paper to efface some ill-considered stroke the floor was scattered with the bread-crumbs and charcoal dust he looked behind the easel and saw his own portrait in the skeleton at the first glimpse of him lucy started not nor stirred but as if her own wand had there enchanted her sat tranced dead embers of departed fires lie by thee thou pale girl with dead embers thou seekest to relume the flame of all extinguished love waste not so that bread eat it in bitterness he turned and entered the corridor and then with outstretched arms paused between the two outer doors of isabel and lucy for ye too my most undiluted prayer is now that from your here unseen and frozen chairs ye may never stir alive the fool of truth the fool of virtue the fool of fate now quits ye for ever as he now sped down the long winding passage some one eagerly hailed him from a stair what what my boy where now in such a squally hurry hallo i say but without heeding him at all pierre drove on millthorpe looked anxiously and alarmedly after him a moment then made a movement in pursuit but paused again there was ever a black vein in this glendinning and now that vein is swelled as if it were just one peg above a tourniquet drawn over tight i scarce durst dog him now yet my heart misgives me that i should shall i go to his rooms and ask what black thing this is that hath befallen him 
no not yet might be thought officious they say i'm given to that i'll wait something may turn up soon i'll into the front street and saunter some and then we'll see chapter five pierre passed on to a remote quarter of the building and abruptly entered the room of one of the apostles whom he knew there was no one in it he hesitated an instant then walked up to a bookcase with a chest of drawers in the lower part here i saw him put them this no here i will try this wrenching open the locked drawer a brace of pistols a powder flask a bullet bag and a round green box of percussion caps lay before him ha ah, what wondrous tools prometheus used who knows but more wondrous these that in an instant can unmake the topmost threescore years and ten of all prometheus makings come here's two tubes that'll outroar the thousand pipes of harlem is the music in em no well then here's powder for the shrill treble and wadding for the tenor and a lead bullet for the concluding bass and 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 i for the top wadding i'll send em back their lie and plant it scorching in their brains he tore off that part of glenn and fred's letter which more particularly gave the lie and having it rammed it home upon the bullets he thrust a pistol into either breast of his coat and taking the rearward passages went down into the back street directing his rapid steps toward the grand central thoroughfare of the city it was a cold but clear quiet and slantingly sunny day it was between four and five of the afternoon that hour when the great glaring avenue was most thronged with haughty rolling carriages and proud rustling promenaders both men and women but these last were mostly confined to the one wide pavement to the west the other pavement was well-nigh deserted save by porters waiters and parcel carriers of the shops on the west pave up and down for three long miles two streams of glossy shawled or broadcloth life unceasingly brushed by each other as long resplendent drooping trains of rival peacocks brush mixing with neither of these pierre stalked midway between from his wild and fatal aspect one way the people took the wall the other way they took the curb unentangledly pierre threaded all their host though in its most in most heart bent he was on a straightforward mathematical intent his eyes were all about him as he went especially he glanced over to the deserted pavement opposite for that emptiness did not deceive him he himself had often walked that side the better to scan the pouring throng upon the other just as he gained a large open triangular space built round with the stateliest public erections the very proscenium of the town he saw glenn and fred advancing in the distance on the other side he continued on and soon he saw them crossing over to him obliquely so as to take him face to face he continued on when suddenly running ahead of fred who now chafingly stood still because fred would not make two in the direct personal assault upon one and shouting liar villain glenn leaped toward pierre from front and with such lightning-like ferocity that the simultaneous blow of his cowhide smote pierre across the cheek and left a half livid and half bloody brand for that one moment the people fell back on all sides from them and left them momentarily recoiled from each other in a ring of panics but clapping both hands to his two breasts pierre on both sides shaking off the sudden white grasp of two rushing girls tore out both pistols and rushed headlong upon glenn for thy one blow take here two deaths tis speechless sweet to murder thee spatterings of his own kindred blood were upon the pavement his own hand had extinguished his house in slaughtering the only unoutlawed human being by the name of glendinning and pierre was seized by a hundred contending hands chapter six that sundown pierre stood solitary in a low dungeon of the city prison the cumbersome stone ceiling almost rested on his brow so that the long tiers of massive cell galleries above seemed partly piled on him his immortal immovable bleached cheek was dry but the stone cheeks of the walls were trickling the pent twilight of the contracted yard coming through the barred arrow slit fell in dim bars upon the granite floor here then is the untimely timely end life's last chapter well stitched in the middle nor book nor author of the book hath any sequel though each hath its last lettering it is ambiguous still had i been heartless now disowned and spurningly portioned off the girl at saddle meadows then had i been happy through a long life on earth and perchance through a long eternity in heaven 
now tis merely hell in both worlds well be it hell i will mould a trumpet of the flames and with my breath of flame breathe back my defiance but give me first another body i long and long to die to be rid of this dishonoured cheek hung by the neck till thou be dead not if i forestall you though oh now to live is death and now to die is life now to my soul were a sword my midwife hark the hangman who comes thy wife and cousin so they say hope they may be they may stay till twelve wheezingly answered the uh, turnkey pushing the tottering girls into the cell and locking the door upon them ye two pale ghosts were this the other world ye were not welcome away good angel and bad angel both for pierre is neuter now o oh, ye stony roofs and sevenfold stony skies not thou art the murderer but thy sister hath murdered thee my brother o oh, my brother at these wailed words from isabel lucy shrunk up like a scroll and noiselessly fell at the feet of pierre he touched her heart dead girl wife or sister saint or fiend seizing isabel in his grasp in thy breast life for infants lodgeth not but death milk for thee and me the drug and tearing her bosom loose he seized the secret vial nesting there chapter seven at night the squat framed asthmatic turnkey tramped the dim-lit iron gallery before one of the long honeycombed rows of cells mighty still there in that hole them two mice i let in hump suddenly at the further end of the gallery he discerned a shadowy figure emerging from the archway there and running on before an officer and impetuously approaching where the turnkey stood more relations coming these wind-broken chaps are always in before the second death seeing they always miss the first hm what a froth the fellow's in wheeze is worse than me where is she cried fred tartan fiercely to him she's not at the murderer's rooms i sought the sweet girl there instant upon the blow but the lone dumb thing i found there only wrung her speechless hands and pointed to the door both birds were flown where is she turnkey i've searched all lengths and breadths but this hath any angel swept a down and lighted in your granite hell broken his wind and broken loose too ain't he wheezed the turnkey to the officer who now came up this gentleman seeks a young lady his sister some way innocently connected with the prisoner last brought in have any females been here to see him oh ay two of em in there now jerking his stump thumb behind him fred darted toward the designated cell oh easy easy young gentleman jingling at his huge bunch of keys easy easy till i get the picks i'm housewife here hallo here comes another hurrying through the same archway toward them there now rapidly advanced a second impetuous figure running on in advance of a second officer where is the cell demanded millthorpe he seeks an interview with the last prisoner explained the second officer kill em both with one stone then wheezed the turnkey gratingly throwing open the door of the cell there's his pretty parlour gentlemen step in regular mouse-hole aren't it might hear a rabbit burrow on the world's t'other side are they all sleep i stumble cried fred from within lucy a light a light lucy and he wildly groped about the cell and blindly caught millthorpe who was also wildly groping blister me not take off thy bloody touch ho ho the light lucy lucy she's fainted then both stumbled again and fell from each other in the cell and for a moment all seemed still as though all breaths were held as the light was now thrust in fred was seen on the floor holding his sister in his arms and millthorpe kneeling by the side of pierre the unresponsive hand in his while isabel feebly moving reclined between against the wall yes yes dead 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 without one visible wound her sweet plumage hides it thou hellish carrion this is thy hellish work thy juggler's rifle brought down this heavenly bird oh my god my god thou scalpest me with this sight the dark veins burst and here's the deluge wreck all stranded here ah pierre my old companion pierre schoolmate playmate friend our sweet boys walks within the woods oh i would have rallied thee and banteringly warned thee from thy too moody ways but thou wouldst never heed what scornful innocence rests on thy lips my friend hands scorched with murder's powder yet how woman soft by heaven these fingers move one speechless clasp all's o'er all's o'er and you know him not came gasping from the wall and from the fingers of isabel 
dropped an empty vial as it had been a run-out sand-glass and shivered upon the floor and her whole form sloped sideways and she fell upon pierre's heart and her long hair ran over him and arbored him in ebon vines Fini. end of chapter twenty six end of pierre or the ambiguities by herman melville